and the Economic Development Committee Chair, Iris Robinson, the Western Wake Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Incorporated welcomes you to day one of the Financial Fortitude Summit. The mindset for small business success and branding is an inside job. Economic development is one of Delta Sigma Theta's five programmatic thrusts. Its purpose is to spread financial education throughout our local communities. This beautiful partnership with Wake Tech Small Business Center has proven to be an amazing way for us to share great information to small business owners throughout our service area. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Cherith so we can move forward with the program. Thank you. Lisa, thank you so much for your partnership. We've, we're thrilled that we're going into year seven of this partnership. Uh, the work that you all do in the community is really inspiring and powerful. And I'm so excited to, to continue with today's Financial Fortitude Summit. So thank you. You all may or may not know this, but in addition to being our programmatic partner for this, Elisa is also our one of our rock star small business counselors. And she gets us so many five-star reviews on our Google My Business page that I'm going to always hold her hand and make sure she's here as a small business counselor. Our clients really love working with her. She does a fantastic job of helping them navigate their small business challenges. So thank you for also being a part of our team uh, here at the Small Business Center, Lisa. Good morning, everybody. I'm Cherith Robertson. I have the honor of leading the Wake Tech Small Business Center and am thrilled that you all are joining us this morning. And I wanna tell you a couple things about who we are as an organization before we jump into today's program. So we're part of the Small Business Center Network of North Carolina. That means that every single community college in North Carolina has a small business center that is funded by your tax dollars. We exist to help people start and grow their business and we do offer some services in a couple of really specific areas. One of those is our one-on-one -on -one confidential free business counseling. I see quite a few people on um, today's session who take advantage of that free business counseling. We have a team of myself and five counselors who are here to serve you in your business. We work with you at your pace to help you reach your business goals. That is free and you can request a, a counseling session and schedule it right through our website. It's very simple. Uh, the other thing that we offer is of course our uh, webinar programming. Eventually, we'll be doing some stuff in person. Actually, we have something coming up next week um, in person uh, in partnership with the Apex Chamber. So I'll throw that into the chat um, at the end of today's session. Um, but we're mostly still virtual. So we're offering webinars. We cover a variety of topics to help you start and grow your business. We really want to make sure that you are filling the foundation of your business because because a strong business foundation is going to allow you to move forward um, in the direction that you want. So today's session, we're really going to be talking and, and the Financial Fortitude Summit over the two days is really about looking at some of those foundational things that small business owners need in order to reach their goals. And a lot of times we want to jump right into tactics. Um, this is a little, sometimes a little, a level below tactics with tactics involved to help you really grasp what you need to do to make revenue in your business because without money, your business isn't sustainable, right? So to make sure you're making revenue in your business, but also aligning it with who you are and your purpose. And I'm not going to give any more away because we have fantastic speakers who are going to do that today. So a couple of logistical things. Um, make sure that you have your chat box open so that you can uh, chat along with us. We'll be asking some questions. We'll be asking you to uh, share some information in the chat. So make sure you have that open. You all have your microphones turned off um, and we'll ask you to keep them muted throughout today's session. If I see somebody accidentally turn it on, I'm usually pretty quick about turning it back off. So let's just use the chat for conversation. And then um, you can have your camera turned on if you'd like, um, or you can turn it off. It's really up to you. I know a lot of people are experiencing Zoom fatigue um, and need a little bit of a camera break. So I absolutely respect that. 
Um, those are our big logistical things. So I'm gonna turn it back over to you, Elisa, to introduce our first speaker and we'll get started. Thank you so much. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce my sorority sister, Dr. Tammy Moore. Um, Dr. Tammy Moore is a licensed clinical psychologist and North Carolina board certified health services provider. She is the founder and CEO of Western Weight Counseling and Psychological Services, LPLLC in Cary. Professionally in her psychology private practice, she treats individuals, couples and families helping them to clarify their feelings, develop goals, and to create a plan of action to achieve those goals. Dr. Moore, a Louisiana native, moved to Cary 18 years ago from Chicago. She earned a bachelor's degree from Louisiana State University, a master's degree from Xavier University in New Orleans, and a doctorate in counseling psychology from Loyola University, Chicago. She completed her psychology internship at Duke University. She also served as a clinical faculty member in the School of Counseling graduate program at UNC Chapel Hill for over 10 years. She is very passionate about her professional and personal endeavors. She and her husband, Jeff, have been married over 30 years. They have four children and a son-in-law and three beautiful grandchildren. Dr. Moore is very active in the local community. She is a charter member of the Western Wake Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, an executive board member of Easter Seals of North Carolina and Virginia, and she serves on various committees with the Triangle Chapter of the Multiple Sclerosis Society. She is also a member of St. Paul AME. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Tammy Moore. Give her a big round of virtual applause. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, everyone. And thank you so much, my beautiful sorority sister. And I hear um, Wake Tech small business counselor, uh, Phenom, Tammy, Alyssa, Tammy Johnson, thank you for that introduction. And thank you, Chair, for inviting me to be a part of the program. I'm really excited to be here. I am, ladies and gentlemen, just the appetizer uh, for today's program. I only have about 20 minutes to kind of just set the stage for the wonderful speakers, uh, Mia and Marnie, that are going to really do the meat and potatoes and, and dessert and everything else that goes along with this workshop. So I am here just to kind of give you an opening introduction to mindset and thinking about mindset in terms of psychology. Uh, for me, as Tammy said, I am a clinical psychologist. I've been practicing for over 20 years. And with that, also a small business owner. Uh, my practice is located in downtown Cary in a little house on, on East Chatham. Uh, prior to that, I was in the Regency Park area for about 15 years. Uh, mindset is really all about the way that you see the world, the way that you make meaning of things around you. And this morning, the few minutes that I have, I really want to talk about mindset, uh, not only as a small business owner, but putting it into the context of what we have been through over the past year. Um, COVID-19, this global pandemic is something that we, none of us have ever experienced in our lifetime. And the gratitude that I feel this morning to still be here and to have my parents still here and uh, most of my loved ones, um, I have an abundance of gratitude. But when you think about two and a half million people died last year, over 500,000 Americans died last year. You have to kind of just take a moment and just ponder that thought. 
you know, because I think we can be so busy in, you know, the world is starting to open up again and we're getting vaccinated, but to sit with the idea of over a half million Americans lost their lives. And if you put it in the context of each one of those lives belong to someone, someone's mother, someone's father, someone's brother, someone's sister, or, or just a friend or family member. So to go through what we have gone through, there's all sorts of mindsets. There's, there's many ways that we are going to view the past year. For those of you that have social media or even just Google photos, you're getting now, last year this happened, those memories are popping up. And one of the things about anniversaries is that it can trigger in you uh, any sort of traumatic uh, event or anything that causes you to feel, as my young adults would say, feel some type of way. Um, I, I didn't understand at first. I'd say, what do you mean? What type of, what do you, but it, it just means you feel out of sorts. So before you take in all of this knowledge today about mindset, I do want you to take some time this morning and just to put it in the context of what you've been through, what you personally have been through, what your business has been through. I can tell you as a business owner, I mentioned I was in Regency Park for 15 years. In January of 2020, I got my brand new location in downtown Cary, had it just perfectly set up. The furniture was just so appealing. I couldn't wait to invite my clients in and just get started. It was just a transition for the business. And lo and behold, March, 2020, everything shut down. We got orders, right? Go home, shut it down. No more restaurants, no more movie theaters. Don't go visit your parents right now everything shut down. So this is where you, you really think back to your mindset back then. I know as a business owner, I had not done telehealth. I love doing in-person face-to-face therapy. I love inviting clients into my office, sitting on a comfortable couch, offering them a cup of tea. But now all of a sudden I had to switch to telehealth. So there's a lot of different directions. And I think about my mindset Prior to COVID-19 pandemic, I had had clients for years saying, hey, Dr. Moore, do you mind if we do a virtual session? Can we connect online? You know, I, I, and honestly, I think about my mindset back then. I thought, ah, uh, uh, I, I just don't know. I like, I need to see you in person. I want so much of therapy is not just what you say. I need to see your affect. I need to see your body language. I need to see if you're carrying around a depression cloud hovering. And I thought, you know, I just was resistant to that. And the same way that my mom was resistant when I tried to convince her to pay her bills online, she absolutely refused to go online and pay her Dillard's credit card online. So I thought about my mindset, but as I switched over to telehealth, I thought, wow, my clients are showing up. I have no no-shows, everybody's here. Um, I'm able to connect in a, in a, in a very similar way. Um, insurance is paying for this, Blue Cross Blue Shield. Thank God that they did because I have a lot of Medicare, uh, a lot of seniors who were on Medicare and because I'm a Medicare provider, I was able to meet with them. And without that connection, they, the loneliness and isolation that they experienced would have just been really, really um, just, just, just scary because many of them were in a facility where they could not have visitors or they had a spouse in a facility. So that mindset, that shift, some people may look at it as resilient. Resilience is just the, the ability to change course when things don't go according to plan. But it's really about your mindset. It's about how you see things. So I want you to think about right now, just a little precursor to the meat and potatoes of today. I'm gonna to give you three questions that I want you to jot down to kind of guide your thinking, to see where you are right now. Think about your small business 
and what you, where you are at this moment, a year post COVID, can you write down for yourself three things that you are currently working on? Three things that you say I'm currently working on and they can be specifically business related or they could be personal. Um, as a small business owner, I know that if I'm not well personally, that's gonna impact my business as well. So if you can jot down three things that you are currently working on, if you feel comfortable and you wanna share it in the chat, that would be great. M Mia and Marty would have some access to kind of see what you guys are working on but it's just to have you reflect right now. What are three things that I am working on in my business and in my personal life? So if you can jot those down to sort of guide your thinking. The second thing I would like for you to write down is three things that you feel proud of. Three things, thinking about, you know what, it's been a full year of changes um, because of this pandemic. But when I look back over the year, what are three things that I really feel proud of? I can personally say I am very proud of the shift that I made to telehealth. And I'm, I, I, I now feel like I will make tell, I do want to go back to in-person therapy because I do love that, but I will maintain telehealth. I will keep that. So I'm very proud of that transition that was made. Um, I'm also very proud of the fact that my family, my adult children and grandchildren, that I feel like our conversations uh, or our connections are more meaningful. It's not, we're not at Cinebistro having dinner, watching a movie, uh, out at the mall. We're actually at home. Uh, we get together, we're in our bubble, we have dinner, we might play Scrabble, we laugh and talk, but I'm very proud of the family shift that we made. And then lastly, as a small business owner, I'm very proud of the financial gains that I have made uh, over the past year. I think slowing down as a small business owner, sometimes we get on the hamster wheel and we got to do it all. And there's this myth out there that people see business owners as, you know, having all of this autonomy and flexibility, which is great. We do have it, but I think we work harder than if I were working at one of the hospitals at Holly Hill or at one of the uh, middle, I would go in at eight and probably be off at four. And there would be a whole team of support people there to help out when I'm not there. But as a small business owner, I'm responsible. So being, I think last year I was able to pay more attention to the financial aspects, stay on top of the QuickBooks, talk to the uh, CPA, get the PPP funds that were available that uh, would help me to kind of move forward in my business. So I'm very proud of that. So hopefully you've got your three things that you feel proud of. If you've juggled family and work, oh my gosh, you got to take pride of that. And as you write those things down, I really, you get some time later on, I want you to say aloud, I am proud of the fact that I did this, or I am proud of that, okay? So you've got the three things you're working on currently. You've got the three things that you're proud of. The last thing I want you to think about, as a small business owner, again, I mentioned autonomy, flexibility, um, you probably like being in charge and you are a helper and you want to provide good customer service and you want people to say good things about your business. But one of the things about being a small business owner and being uh, resilient and strong is that often you don't know how to ask for help. You don't know how to ask for support. So I'd like for you to take some time and jot down three things, three areas where you say, gosh, I know I could get it done, but I could really use some support in this. I really could use some support. And, and, and whether it's someone, you know, helping me out with a, with a, a PPP um, form that I need to do, or I need some help with, 
uh, making sure my kids are getting their remote work done. Uh, I need some help in talking with my partner about sharing the load. So come up with three things that you feel like you need some support in. So in doing this sort of self-assessment, I'm trying to prime you for Marnie and Mia so that as they share this information, you know where you are. It's sort of like if you're gonna do a road trip out to California, you wanna start out preparing yourself for that trip. You wanna get your, you know, you wanna map it out and see what hotel you're gonna stay on on I-10 and pack up everything. So prior to this getting all of this information about mindset, do your own self-assessment. What are the three things that I'm working on currently? What are the three things that I'm proud of? And what are the three areas that I could use some support? And with those thoughts in mind, as you receive this new information, the, the, the valuable tools and strategies that your presenters will give you today, you will try to fit them into your personal needs and how maybe get some ideas and strategies. Um, that is what I, I really want you as, as just the appetizer of this. I also want to just leave you with the thought that this is something that I'm, I'm thinking about my business after 20 years, I'm calling it act two. And where do I want to go in the now that the kids are all out of the house and you know they've started their own families and my husband's ready to retire from his Cisco career and I'm like well what do I do for Act Two, so as I'm doing that I'm asking myself the same questions I absolutely love what I do there's never a day that I uh, come up to my office and say I don't want to be here, and uh, so that's important as I think about my Act Two. But let me just say this, my new slogan for act two, and I know you guys are going to talk about branding next time, but I want to get across to the world that mental health is health. That we need to cease the separation of mental and physical and spiritual health. I think if anything, what we can take from the COVID-19 pandemic is we're going to enter a second pandemic, but it's going to be a mental health pandemic. People are going to, um, the, the, the implications and the consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic, whether it's unwanted weight changes, everybody's talking about the COVID-19 or COVID 10 pounds they've gained or their health habits, things like that. Increased depression, increased anxiety uh, with our seniors, the isolation and the loneliness. The research has shown those to isolation and loneliness when you're over 60 is a greater health risk factor than smoking and obesity for seniors being alone. So asking yourself, those the questions that I ask. And then also, let me just say, since mental health is health, it used to be people would say, when do I when should I seek out a counselor? When should I seek out a therapist? And we sort of had this line in the sand where we said, if it interferes with your functioning, if you can't go to work, or you're not performing well at work, or if you're just not interested in things you used to enjoy. But today, as we move forward, as a result of this pandemic, I say at any moment, any time, seek out counseling. You don't have to have anything major going on. Seek out counseling. Um, as a psychologist, it's all about you. If you come into therapy for me, uh, you, it's not a reciprocal thing. You don't have to be worried about me. This is your time and I'm here to help you to strategize and to come up with a plan of action. So I hope this, this just thinking about the three things you're working on, the three things you're proud of, and the three areas that you need some support that you will reflect on those throughout the day and the information that you receive from Marnie and Mia, that this will help you to come up with strategies and solutions. And I just wanna thank you all for this 
brief opportunity. I have been a member of my sorority uh, for 30, over 35 years. And I love the work that we do in the community. And I thank Alyssa Johnson and Cherith from Wig Tech for inviting me to do the little opener. And I know that you guys will get so much from your workshop. So thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Dr. Moore. Um, we really hope you did an amazing job kicking this off for us. So hopefully everyone will take away the self-assessment that you recommended for them to do. And those are the three things that you are currently working on, um, the th three things that you feel proud of, and um, the three areas in which you need help. So remember, mental health is health. So now I'm going to introduce our next um, speaker. Um, her name is Marnie Blythe, uh, and she is known as the business rainmaker, helping entrepreneurs have a clearly defined vision to maximize financial growth while developing health cohesive teams. Marnie comes from a long line of entrepreneurs. Her great grandfather, grandfather and father instilled in her from a young age, the value of joy, freedom and challenges that come with being a business owner. Marnie moved to New York at the age of 18 to attend New York University. She began her corporate career working for advertising agencies to pay her way through school while concurrently fostered her passion for entrepreneurship when she started her first company, throwing networking events for thousands of young professionals at the hottest nightclubs in New York. She climbed a corporate ladder and found herself at the age of just 26, working as C-suite level marketing and advertisement agency executive, having developed and implemented award-winning national campaigns for Fortune 500 and 100 companies like Anheuser-Busch, Claritin, and Nokia, in 38 locations around the U.S., this innovative online and offline campaigns touch millions of consumers, resulting in millions of dollars for clients. She was always been on the cutting edge of technology, being one of the first marketers to use text to strategies, live stream, live events, and social media to create experiences for consumers with brands. As exciting as working at agencies were, at the age of 27, her soul craved a life of entrepreneur, and she joined a network marketing company called Musentials, where she grew a sales team of 2,000 people on the East Coast. She found herself seeking a different life and moved to North Carolina when she was 30. Since then, Marnie has successfully grown and sold multiple companies, including 8,000 square feet holistic health and fitness center with annual revenue of multi, multiple six figures. After the sale of a holistic health and fitness center, she began full pocket coaching, which provides personalized business coaching experience that encompasses billion dollar corporate sales and marketing strategies for re-engineered for the small business owner. Marnie was introduced to Entrepreneurial Operating Systems or ES EOS in 2019 when one of her medical weight loss center's clients asked if she could provide fractional integrator services. She delved into the world of business system and found that it was the most comprehensive and proven system on the market, providing end-to-end -end solutions with a proven track record. With over 16 years of history and more than 80,000 companies currently using the tools, EOS is a proven system that consistently helps companies achieve more revenue growth and profit while delivering a better balance of life business owners and leaders. Over the last two years, Marnie has implemented the system for multiple clients, including herself, with powerful results. Marnie is extraordinarily passionate about helping small business owners and their teams live their best lives, and EOS is an incredible tool to help you get there. Having had the blessing of being featured a featured podcast guest, national and local speaker for the last 10 years, sharing the principles and strategies for entrepreneurs 
to create massive financial gains in their businesses um, and more freedom in their personal lives is an incredible honor and privilege. On a personal note, Marnie is blessed to have a beautiful six-year-old daughter and a 20-month-old Maltese, Charity. <laughs> Charity and service are incredibly important to her, and she is committed to ongoing philanthropic work to help patients with suffering with blood cancers through her charitable giving to Little Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. Over the last 10 years, she has helped generate thousands of dollars to help the critical life-saving research and patient support at the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. And with further ado, I present to you, Marnie Blythe. Oh my thank you. Thank, thank, you gosh, thank you so much. Wow. <laughs> Alyssa, thank you so much. And it's a pleasure to meet you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you to Chara. Thank you to Mia. Thank you to everybody who is here and making this possible today. I am so excited. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to jump in and I'm going to share my screen. And if you guys can do me a favor, I would be really, really, really grateful if just for a moment, if nothing else, you go ahead and come on video so I can see all of your beautiful faces. I would really appreciate that. So if you just wanna kind of just take a minute and go ahead and let me see your faces, I would absolutely love that. If not, I totally understand, but wow. I don't really need to say a whole lot because Alyssa did such a beautiful job. Um, so I'll just kind of do a couple of quick things. I'm going to say thank you again to the Wake Tech um, Small Business Center. I had an amazing blessing of being able to work with 12 entrepreneurs for 12 hours during the fall, thanks to the CARES Act. And I see many of their beautiful faces on uh, this Zoom today. So I want to say thank you to you guys for being here. Wanted to just tell you a little bit about my core values and the core values that we represent here at Full Pocket Coaching, uh, because um, in that beautiful introduction, we didn't get to talk about that. But my core values are to be a servant leader. So I am here to serve first. So I want to make this interactive, okay? Sometimes we can have Zoom fatigue. So I want you guys to be active. I want you guys to be involved and engaged so I can serve you. That's what this is about. This is not about me. This is not about Wake Tech today. This is about you and helping you in your business, okay? Integrity. Integrity is incredibly important to me. It's about doing the right thing when nobody else is watching. It means going to bed at night, being able to put your hand on your heart and say, I did the best I could today and I feel good about what I did. It's about grow or die. And I know you all understand that as a business owner, you're either growing or you're dying. And we're here to grow, grow, grow. So if you are ready to grow, I want you to go ahead and pop grow in the chat for me so that I know you're here and I know that you are ready to learn. It's about compassion, okay? Because we all know that everybody needs grace and compassion and it's about vulnerability. And we're gonna talk about that today and that's gonna be really important. So as you heard, our mission here at Full Pocket is about helping business owners to live a better life. And we like to provide relief. It's really important. Relief is a big thing for us because we know that you're there. We know that you need help and we want you to be relieved. I'm seeing your beautiful faces, everybody. Thanks for going ahead and getting on video this morning. Give me a big smile. Are you guys ready to learn? Give me a thumbs up if you are. Yes, thank you. I love it. Carla, I love it. Suzanne, I love it. Lisa, Antoinette, Kim, Amari, Rudika. I hope I'm pronouncing your names correctly, but let's go. All right, so let's do a little bit of housekeeping. I'm going to ask you first and foremost to give me your full attention. Attention, attention. Please, please, please give me your attention this morning, okay? So what does that mean? That means I'd like you to take a moment now, shut down whatever other windows are open on your computer shut the door, ask whomever is around you to please give you this, these moments to be here with me now. So take this moment now, just gonna give you a moment, shut it all down. I'm gonna ask for your undivided attention. I'm going to be selfish and ask for all of it, <laughs> okay? So we're gonna do that. I'm gonna ask you to be vulnerable, okay? I'm gonna ask you to be with me and just allow this to, without judgment, to just come in because we're going to do some big work this morning about growth and mindset, okay? This is going to be big. Golden nuggets. You're going to feel like we're opening our fire hose on you and that's done purposely, okay? But I want you to think about what are the golden nuggets you're going to take away from today. So get that pen and paper ready. 
because we're going to share a lot of information with you, but just focus on the golden nuggets for me, okay? So then resources are available to you. As Cherith shared with you, Wake Tech Small Business Center is here. We are all here to help you. At the end of this presentation, I will share with you our contact information. I want you to stay connected with me. I am a servant leader, which means if you have questions, thoughts, concerns, reach out to me. I am happy to be of help to you be engaged. So I want you to chat to us in the comments and we're going to begin with introductions, not of me, but of you. So get in the chat right now. I want to hear your name. I want to hear your business. And I want uh, you to go ahead and give me a little bit of chat right now so that I can see that we are all together here. So go ahead and give me a little bit of that in the comments, if you will, please. And I'm going to try to find the chat and I'm going to be able to see all the fabulous people. Okay, I see lots of people saying they're growing. We've got, let's see, we've got Amari and she's got, we are moving so fast, y'all. I love this. Okay, let me just see who all we've got here this morning. Amari, East Cloud, Stratton Parr, Angel with Fathom, Cherie with First Impression Home Staging. We've got Radhika, we've got Mel, we've got my girl Carla, we've got my girl Cherie, we've got Alice, we've got Edith, we've got Antoinette. This is just so awesome. Welcome, welcome, welcome everybody. Terrific. Next, I want to hear what town are you in? What town are you popping in from? Go ahead and let me know. We got people probably here. We've got Apex, we've got Nightdale, we've got Wake Forest, we've got Raleigh, we've got, oh my goodness, we've got Durham. We have all of North Carolina here in the house. This is awesome. I want you guys to keep it going. This is so good. Welcome to you all. All right, so once we're gonna give you guys one more moment to finish that up and then we're gonna just take a moment and we're going to just chill. We're just going to kind of come into this moment, right? And this is about starting to engage your presence. So I want you to close your eyes and I want you to get your feet planted firmly on the ground. <sighs> perhaps you can go ahead and maybe put your thumb and your middle fingers together, or perhaps you just lean them just nice on your legs, palms facing up. I want you to close your eyes and I want you to take a deep breath in and just hold it for a few seconds and then breathe out. Awesome, let's do that again. Big inhale. Awesome, hold it. Excellent. I want you to open your eyes and I want you to notice any change. If you feel anything different after taking a moment, maybe you need to take another breath. Just notice any changes, okay? Just begin to sort of center in, okay? Awesome. So let's go ahead and we're going to start with our agenda for what we're gonna cover off on today, okay? So one, we're gonna talk about a growth or a fixed mindset, and that's an important designation for us to begin with. Second, we're gonna talk, talk about our tools, and we've got a five-step process that we're gonna walk you through this morning. Then we're going to talk to you about this checklist that we have that you can actually go and take for yourself online interactive. And then we're going to save time for questions. So if you have questions throughout the presentation, go ahead and pop them in the chat throughout the presentation. And then we're going to circle back at the end and I'm going to do my best to answer all the questions that you might have. Okay, so let's jump in. So we're going to first talk about the difference between a growth mindset and a fixed mindset, okay? So first and foremost, a growth mindset is the belief that an individual's most basic abilities and skills can be developed through dedication and hard work, that brains and talent are just the beginning, okay? A fixed mindset is the belief that what you got is what you got. Your intelligence, your talents are just fixed traits. So. I want you guys to set in the chat for me. Are you here? Do you have a growth mindset or do you have a fixed mindset? Grow, growth or fixed. And this is not a judgment thing. I'm hoping that by the time we get through with today, you're gonna say growth, but go ahead and let me know. You, are you here? Are you, are you ready to grow? Okay, depends on the situation. Growth mindset, I love this. Great, thank you guys for sharing this. And FYI, Carol Dweck at the bottom of this that I put is um, who has this wonderful book about mindset. 
uh, and she's the one who kind of has talked a lot about this. So this is fixed on the left. This is growth on the right. So if you are fixed, you're going to avoid challenges. You're going to give up easily. You see effort is fruitless. You ignore useful feedback. Uh, you're threatened by other success. But if you're in a growth mindset that all of you are here or you're ready to move and it's okay if you're stuck, we're going to get you from stuck into growth. You're going to be ready to embrace challenges. You're going to persist despite obstacles, which I know many of you are already doing. You're going to see effort as a path to mastery. You're going to learn from criticism. You're going to be inspired by other success. Okay. So let's start with our first tool, which is presence. And I know that you're all here with me and you're present, right? Okay. So presence. When you are present, you are in the flow, right? It's the feeling you get when you completely forget about yourself and the surroundings. Do you guys notice the picture on the bottom right? How many of you out there are moms or dads? If you're a mom or dad, type in the chat, mom or dad. And on the right, I want you to think back, if you're a mom or a dad, to that moment when you first saw your baby. Were you present? Yes, you were there. You were a loving presence. There was nothing else in the world that you were thinking about, that you were focused on. And that is what presence is when you are fully there, okay? When is the last time you felt that way? There's a difference between resting and the state of flow or being present. With resting, we're not making any effort and there's no skill required. When it comes to presence, you have to make an effort to be present, okay? You can use your senses. So a lot of times when I work with clients, we talk about using our senses in order to bring us into that present moment. What do you see? What do you feel? What do you taste? What can you touch? Uh, what, can, what can you hear, right? So, or, uh, and then another one that I like to use with clients is we can do this where we can break, use our fingers and just touching our, like this to bring us into the present moment. And the breath, this is all how we come into the present moment, our breath. So this is not about multitasking, okay? And that's really important. It's about having complete focus in the moment, okay? So if you're like many of us, you might find yourself feeling constantly tired and like there's enough time in the day. Okay, and I know many people feel this way. There is always time to pause and breathe. And this is really important. So I want you to write down, golden nugget here, take time to breathe, but focus on that breath. This is a huge tool. Short breaks and breathing is paramount to a growth mindset, believe it or not. And while this seems like it might be really basic and simple, it is not something that's easy to remember. Here at Full Pocket Coaching, we are all about simple tools. So I want you to go ahead and remember that being able to take small breaks is all part of being able to cultivate this growth mindset, okay? So being present means to be fully engaged in this present moment without any distractions. It means that you're allowing your brain to function as it's supposed to instead of bombarding it with too much information, okay? So we don't need to accept being constantly busy because we believe it's a part of modern life, okay? This is your brain. This is your brain with one task. Does anybody remember those commercials? This is your brain on multitasking, wasted brain power. Do you see how much wasted brain power there is over here? So we give in society so much credit people. Oh, I'm a great multitasker, but this is actually really debilitating. So today I'm going to ask you to, to think about eliminating the word busy from your vocabulary, okay? When people say, how are you? Oh my gosh, I'm just so busy, right? How about let's eliminate that and just say, I've got a blessedly full plate, a lot, lot going on, but I'm, and I'm focused on one thing at a time. If you can take that pledge to eliminate the word busy from your vocabulary, I want you to go ahead and give me a thumbs up in the chat or a yes, okay? I want you to consider that for today. Switching from one thought to the next or one action to the next in hope of doing more, it might trick you into making you feel more accomplished, but how 
However, often it also makes us feel tired or irritable or exhausted. Do you know what I'm talking about? Okay. I want you to take a look at this picture. Look at these beautiful faces. Children are fully absorbed in their playtime. Think about your kids, right? And, or kids that you're, you're close with. They are connected to whatever they're doing, regardless of how long it takes. And in fact, children don't take any notice of how quickly the time goes by. So we need in many ways to sort of get back to that childhood abandon, that childhood presence in our everyday life. And the funny thing is, is you're here right now with me, right? And you're super engaged and you're saying, yes, I'm going to do that. But the moment you get off of this, it's like you have a, like a mind eraser or something and you're going to forget. So we need tools in order to help us remember. So some of the basic things you can do is to write yourself a post-it note. Pop it on your screen, pop it on the mirror in your bathroom, put it on the refrigerator, put it on your car, set an alarm on your phone. These are all different things that you can do because you have to remember yourself, okay, in order to be present. It's very important. And sometimes you only need to reconnect with the present moment to be in the present, appreciating the warmth and aroma of a nice cup of tea or coffee, breathing in fresh air, listening to your loved ones and paying attention, being really present with that. And this is about connection, folks. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the importance of connection in a few minutes when we talk about vulnerability. But this is why we're here. Connection is why we're here. We're not here to multitask, okay? So when's the last time you were completely absorbed in an activity where the hours flew by? Here are some of the activities that help people to feel more um, alive and more present and happier. Exercising, dancing, learning a new skill, playing a musical instrument, painting, volunteering, meditating, planning a holiday. Pop in the chat for me and tell me what do you do that makes you happy or what's your thing that helps you to feel present? Is it exercise? Is it dancing? Uh, or what do you want to get engaged in? I love yoga too, Stratton. Uh, and I would love to be a better gardener, Suzette. And, and I love to dance too. I love this. I love all of this. Monique, interior decorating. That's awesome. Nancy says driving. Michelle says exercise. Michelle is awesome with that. Painting, reading, and yoga. Uh, this is great. Patricia says meditating. Cherie says talking on the phone with a friend. This is awesome. I just love this for everybody. So, so great. So I want to share with you that the sometimes the downside though with presence is that being more present can also sometimes bring in some discomfort. And there are going to be some moments when we might feel sad or anxious, angry, tense, vulnerable, or in pain. I'm sure you understand what I'm talking about. This is okay. You don't give, need me to give you permission, but I'm going to give you permission and say to you, allow yourself to feel. You have to feel the feelings in order for them to pass through you. And if you go there, or if you allow yourself to be present and feel the feelings, this is the first step to transformation. This is the first step towards a growth mindset and the key element in the journey and learning to not compensate with or numb out because of food or drinks or denying it. We just need to acknowledge it, even if it's only for a little bit of a moment, okay? So I want you to think about anything you do on a daily basis and ask yourself how often you set a clear intention prior to beginning that task, okay? Here's a golden nugget setting intention. This is an applicable skill. Each time you sit down to do something, bringing your presence, bringing your attention and your intention. Often intention is almost subconscious autopilot and it's running behind the scenes. And I want us to take it out of the subconscious and bring it straight forward into this conscious moment. And this is activating additional attention on what you're doing. And it's better yet to have the intention. So this is a little affirmation. I am awake and aware, and I choose to be fully present as I blank, okay? So what is going to be your intention for today? I am aware, uh, awake and aware, and I choose to be fully present as I fill in the blank, chat it to me. What are you going to set an intention to do today? I want to see it. Go ahead and pop it in the chat for me. 
one of the reasons so many people meditate and that there are meditation tra uh, traditions is that we focus on the breath. So this is another application, okay? Breathing, okay? And so the breath is everything, you guys. Bringing your awareness into that moment, into the breath, you ground yourself into the here and the now. Deep, full breathing can calm the mind, it soothes the body, and it takes you into the timeless eternity of each moment. Pranayama, okay? This is something that we can all do some research around. I'm going to go ahead and type it in the chat so everybody sees it. Uh, prana. Yama, there we go. And these are different breathing techniques and these are so helpful. So I'm going to say, I don't have time to teach them to you today, but go and research that. In the middle of any activity that's pulling your mind into the past or the present, the breath, if you just focus on that, and if there's something that triggers you during the day, whatever that might be, that's the time to go to the breath. So I want us to think about creating a playground for mindfulness. And mindfulness is a word that we hear a lot of people talking about. And it's really a mental state achieved when you focus your awareness on the present moment, accepting our feelings and just ready to move forward, okay? Uh, so here are some other ways that you can practice mindfulness. Mindful eating, doing the dishes, waiting in line, being in the shower, driving, walking a pet, doing the laundry. I also, I shared with you a couple of ways that I remind myself to be aware and remember myself, but often I'll actually set reminders in my phone and I'll have them go off periodically throughout the day. And I'll actually attach a little note to it that says, remember yourself or remember to breathe. Again, post-it notes, simple, simple stuff. But like I said, often we just forget because we're so on autopilot. So I want you to set this for yourself for today. Okay. Life is always now in this present moment. When you're present, you're in alignment. So surrendering to the now without any judgment is one of the most powerful practices to end suffering and know your true self and the surrender to what is, not the past or the future, um, but really being able to sort of move forward. Okay, so let's go ahead and we'll jump into the next slide, which is mindful awareness or the next section. Okay, so the next section, is everybody still with me, by the way? If you are still with me, give me a thumbs up, give me a yes in the chat. I wanna make sure that you're here with me and that you are present. So give me a quick little chat, everybody. Monique is with me, Rachel's with me. She says, this is awesome. Thank you so much. Lindsay says, you. awesome. If you are not on mute, please move yourself. Carla's here, Nancy's here, Amari's here, Stratton's here. Ben says, yo, what's up? Aliyah's here. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. It's hard when you're not in front of a room full of people, so it helps me to stay energized when I get this from you. So I appreciate that. Okay, so next. The ability to observe without evaluating is the highest form of intelligence. Huh, what does that mean? Okay, tool number two. Thank you, Lauren and Diana and Genesis. Tool number two is cultivating something we call metacognition, or mindful awareness. So this is something called thinking about thinking. Hmm, what does that mean? <laughs> so this is about how often do you watch or pay attention to the activity of your mind? So if you think that you are your mind, today is a golden nugget and the you're not your mind. The mind is a tool. So it's about, I'm, I'm thinking about thinking, or as my good friend Brene Brown likes to say, I'm telling a story that, and so this is a huge, 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 huge tool in our growth mindset opportunity. So many people do not realize that we have two distinct levels of our mind, okay? We have um, both of them in operation at any moment in time. And in order to live an optimal life, a balance of both is needed. Your higher self, your higher mind, or your heart versus your thinking mind, your lower mind, or your ego self. If you've heard this concept before, go ahead and say yes. And tell me um, in your world, what do you like to call it? 
higher self, higher mind, thinking mind, lower self, ego self. Give me a little bit of feedback because for some people, this might be a brand new concept or for some of you, you might've heard this before. I don't want to get too caught up uh, in what it's called. I'm more, um, more, it's more important to me that you start to understand the philosophy of what's involved here. Yes, wise mind, that's another one. Focus, mindfulness, inner self, I love this. So we perceive and interpret countless thoughts throughout the day, right? So I want to start to help you to understand the difference between the two. On the left-hand side, we have our, what we call our thinking mind or our lower mind or our ego self. On the right side, we have our higher self. And this right here is a huge part of this growth mindset. So on the left, I'm a victim of my circumstance. On the right, I create my own reality. On the left, I live in scarcity and there's never enough. On the right, I live in abundance. There's always enough, right? I'm alive temporarily. That's scary. I'm alive temporarily. And this is awesome. I'm in competition with the world. I'm in harmony with the world. It's complicated. I am happy. So we're starting to see the difference between when we tap into this higher part of ourselves. Okay. Now, Let's start to talk about moving from your head to your heart. And I'm going to tell y'all that I really had to do a lot of work. This has been a 15 year journey for me uh, to, in order to develop these, this process. And so when we're in our head voice, we have pride and ego and anger and jealousy. And when we move into our heart, we have sympathy and grace and unity and forgiveness. So I know that it has been a really big struggle for me. And finally, I feel like after 15 years, I spend a lot of time, a lot of time in my, my, my heart, right? And, but it's sometimes really hard, right? Like oftentimes my head wants to override my heart. And that's when I'm able to sort of create this space and say, huh, what am, I, what am I thinking about here? And does this still work for me? So if you're one of those people, just go ahead and put head or heart. Where do you think you're spending the majority of your time right now? Um, so let's go ahead, tell me, tell me that. And this is not a judgment thing. We are not judging. We are just really like evaluating. And, and it's just, huh, isn't that interesting that this is what I've been doing? And maybe I wanna make another choice. And it's just as simple as that. And that's what we're going to talk about in tool number three. I love you guys. Thank you so much for all this great feedback and this, this honesty and just being here and vulnerability. This is beautiful. Love this. Thank you guys so much for sharing. This is awesome. So I want to share with you that staying in your higher mind or your higher self as often as possible sets you up for a mindset of success. And the presence, being present so that you can be aware of who you are showing up as is 85% of this whole thing, okay? So this practice can be for, performed during any activity and it almost brings a meditative quality to any experience that you're having. When you put your attention on the content of your thoughts, where they came from, their associations, or how they make you feel when you think them. For example, you step out of the thought stream and you can be a witness to these thoughts without judgment. If you've heard of Eckhart Tolle, uh, he wrote the um, book, The Power of Now, and he talks about this concept of being the watcher, right? So being able to sort of almost pull that brain out and be able to go, huh, brain, what are you thinking about? And not judging it, just kind of looking at it. So let's have some fun. What are you thinking about right now? Hmm, be honest. Are you thinking about what I'm talking about? Or are you thinking about what you have to make for dinner for your kids? <laughs> Living in the now. Your toddler starting school this week. Yes, see how our brain just wants to jump everywhere, right? You need to read more. Oh, I'm sorry that your daughter's upset. You're immersed in my talk. I love it, Sheree. So I want you guys to just pay attention starting this process. And again, I'm not mad at you if you're having thoughts of being other places. That's okay. I just want you to begin to notice how the brain automatically is constantly wanting to pull you in different directions. When you're aware that that's happening, pull it back in. Samia says she needs to go feed the hens. Hopefully they're not starving and hopefully we can get to them a little bit later. <laughs> so 
cultivating this thing is about being non-judgmental, holding the good and the bad without preference. And one of the tools that I love to teach people about, and it's something that I learned from a teacher in New York City, his name is Joseph Russo. Joseph is now about 88 years old. And he taught me this tool of, isn't that interesting? It's it completely without emotion. And it's just a way of evaluating. Isn't that interesting that I keep thinking about X? Huh? We just then pull the mind back, right? Just pulling it back, right? So that is what we need to do. So golden nugget tool, isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting that that's how I chose to react to that situation? Isn't that interesting? We can use it all the time. So go ahead, rip off and duplicate, r and it, go ahead and use it. So the brain is not static. It's like a muscle. And many scientists once believed that the brain's ability to change and grow was only possible in early childhood. That is not the case, you guys. Not the case at all, as a matter of fact, okay? So recent neuroscience shows that our brains are much more malleable than we thought, and it continues to change into old age. And so through repeated practice and exposure to new challenges, we can create pathways that make our brains stronger and smarter. The brain is constantly creating and destroying neural pathways, forming thought and behavior patterns that we used to make decisions. So what happens is the pathways that are used get stronger and those that are underused grow weak and will get replaced. So you can absolutely reprogram your brain for success. So if you find yourself constantly in that place where it feels dark and scary uh, and you're, you're kind of beating yourself up, the great news is, is you have the opportunity, you have the ability to change all of that, okay? So you can be aware of the thoughts you're thinking, be present so that you can change the pathways of the brain and then we can wire you for total success, okay? So next, vulnerability, okay? So you guys still with me? If you're with me, go ahead and say yes. Tell me that you're here and give me a little bit of love in the chat. Awesome, thank you guys, this is awesome. Oh, I appreciate it so much. Okay, so y'all are going to love this next section. So courage starts with showing up and letting ourselves be seen. So I am going to lean in and I'm going to tell each and every one of you out there, congratulations. You are here. You had the courage to show up. You're interacting. You had the courage to be seen. So I am celebrating you, okay? So it starts with showing up and letting ourselves be seen. This is Brene Brown, and I love me some Brene Brown. So what we're going to do is I'm going to tell you a little bit about her if you don't already know, and then I'm going to let you guys watch about 15 minutes of this video um, that is so powerful that if you haven't seen it, you're in for a big, big, big treat. So Brene Brown, she is a qualitative researcher and storyteller. She is about expanding your perception. I want you guys to know that connection is why we are here. And you have to connect to yourself first before you can connect to other people. Cultivating a belief that you are worthy of love and belonging. Today, with this number, tool number three is about vulnerability. And vulnerability can be a really scary thing, right? But I want you to understand that it's about vulnerability with healthy boundaries, right? This doesn't mean sharing your most inner secrets with the world and just putting it out there, right? You have to know who and how to be vulnerable. Um, but I wanna go ahead and I wanna hop in and I wanna pop open this video for you guys. And we're gonna go in to, um, to watch it because it is so important. And I think that it really is gonna set the stage. So I'm gonna just kind of fast forward it up to number 405 um, so that you guys can start watching it. Uh, and feel free to go back uh, and you can listen, but Brene is gonna to talk to you about her research of six years and what she has found out about the people who live wholehearted lives. And this is everything when it comes to a growth mindset. So go ahead and let's Wait, get my started. Work as well, because when you ask people about love, they tell you about heartbreak. When you ask people about belonging, they'll tell you their most excruciating experiences of being excluded. Mm -hmm. When you ask people about connection, the stories they told me were about disconnection. 
So very quickly, really about six we weeks into research, I ran into oh, this okay. unnamed thing. Thank you. Hold on. Let me escape out. Hold on. Let me get it. Uh, one moment. Thanks for your patience as we experience a moment of technical issues. That absolutely unwrap. Okay. Way my work went as well because Good. when you ask people about love, thank you. They tell you about heartbreak. When you ask people about belonging, they'll tell you their most excruciating experiences of being excluded. And when you ask people about connection, the stories they told me were about disconnection. So very quickly, really about six weeks into this research, I ran into this unnamed thing that absolutely unraveled connection in a way that I didn't understand or had never seen. And so I pulled back out of the research and thought, I need to figure out what this is. And it turned out to be shame. And shame is really easily understood as the fear of disconnection. Is there something about me that if other people know it or see it, that I won't be worthy of connection? The things I can tell you about it, it's universal. We all have it. The only people who don't experience shame have no capacity for human empathy or connection. No one wants to talk about it. And the less you talk about it, the more you have it. What underpinned this shame, this I'm not good enough, which we all know that feeling, I'm not blank enough, I'm not thin enough, rich enough, beautiful enough, smart enough, promoted enough. Um, the thing that underpinned this was excruciating vulnerability. This idea of in order for connection to happen, we have to allow ourselves to be seen, really seen. And you know how I feel about vulnerability. I hate vulnerability. And so I thought, this is my chance to beat it back with my measuring stick. I'm going in. I'm going to figure this stuff out. I'm going to spend a year. I'm going to totally deconstruct shame. I'm going to understand how vulnerability works. And I'm going to outsmart it. So I was ready. And I was really excited. As you know, it's not going to turn out well. Um, <laughs> you know this. So I could tell you a lot about shame, but I'd have to borrow everyone else's time. But here's what I can tell you that it boils down to. And this may be one of the most important things that I've ever learned in the decade of doing this research. My one year has turned into six years, thousands of stories, hundreds of long interviews, focus groups. At one point, people were sending me journal pages and sending me their stories, um, thousands of pieces of data. Um, in six years, and I kind of got a handle on it. I kind of understood this is what shame is, this is how it works. I wrote a book, I published a theory, but something was not okay. Um, and what it was is that if I roughly took the people I interviewed and divided them into people who really have a sense of worthiness, that's what this comes down to, a sense of worthiness. They have a strong sense of love and belonging and folks who struggle for it and folks who are always wondering if they're good enough. There was only one variable that separated the people who have a strong sense of love and belonging and the people who really struggle for it. And that was the people who have a strong sense of love and belonging believe they're worthy of love and belonging. That's it. They believe they're worthy. And to me, the hard part of the one thing that keeps us out of connection is our fear that we're not worthy of connection was something that personally and professionally, I felt like I needed to understand better. So what I did is I took all of the interviews where I saw worthiness, where I saw people living that way and just looked at those. What do these people have in common? And I have, I have a slight office supply addiction, but it's another talk. Um, so I had a manila notebook, a manila folder, and I had a Sharpie. And I was like, what am I going to call this research? And the first words that came to my mind were wholehearted. These are kind of wholehearted people living from this deep sense of worthiness. So I wrote at the top of the manila folder. And I started looking at the data. In fact, I did it first in this very four, in a four-day 
very intensive data analysis where I went back, pulled these interviews, pulled the stories, pulled the incidents. What's the, what's the theme? What's the pattern? My husband left town with the kids um, because I always go into this kind of Jackson Pollock crazy thing where I'm just like writing and, and going and kind of just in my researcher mode. And so here's what I found. What they had in common was a sense of courage. And I want to separate courage and bravery for you for a minute. Courage, the original definition of courage, when it first came into the English language, it's from the Latin word cur meaning heart, and the original definition was to tell the story of who you are with your whole heart. And so these folks had, very simply, the courage to be imperfect. They had the compassion to be kind to themselves first and then to others, because as it turns out, we can't practice compassion with other people if we can't treat ourselves kindly. And the last was they had connection, and this was the hard part, as a result of authenticity. They were willing to let go of who they thought they should be in order to be who they were, which is you have to absolutely do that for connection. The other thing that they had in common was this. They fully embraced vulnerability. They believed that what made them vulnerable made them beautiful. They didn't talk about vulnerability being comfortable, nor did they really talk about it being excruciating, as I had heard earlier in the shame interviewing. They just talked about it being necessary. They talked about the willingness to say, I love you first. The willingness to do something where there are no guarantees. The willingness to breathe through waiting for the doctor to call after your mammogram. The willing to invest in a relationship that may or may not work out. They thought this was fundamental. I personally thought it was betrayal. Um, I could not believe I had pledged allegiance to research where our job, you know, the definition of research is to control, control and predict, to study phenomenon for the, reason, for the ex explicit reason to control and predict. And now my very, you know, my mission to control and predict had turned up the answer that the way to live is with vulnerability and to stop controlling and predicting. This led to a little breakdown. <laughs> looked more like this. Um, it, did. it led to a, I call it a breakdown, my therapist calls it a spiritual awakening. <laughs> spiritual awakening sounds better than breakdown, but I assure you it was a breakdown. And I had to put my data away and go find a therapist. Let me tell you something. You know who you are when you call your friends and say, I think I need to see somebody who, do you have any recommendations? Because about five of my friends are like, woo, I wouldn't want to be your therapist. Um, <laughs> And I was like, what does that mean? And they're like, I'm just saying, you know, like, don't bring your measuring stick. Uh, I was like, okay. So I found a therapist. My first meeting with her, Diana, I brought in my list of the way the wholehearted live. And I sat down and she said, you know, how are you? And I said, I'm great, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. And she said, what's going on? And I said, and this is a therapist who sees therapists because we have to go to those because their BS meters are good. Um, <laughs> and so I said, here's the thing, I'm struggling. And she said, what's the struggle? And I said, well, I have a vulnerability issue. And, you know, and I know that vulnerability is kind of the core of shame and fear and our struggle for worthiness, but it appears that it's also the birthplace of joy, of creativity, of belonging, of love. And I, I think I have a problem and I just, I need some help. And I said, but here's the thing, no family stuff, no childhood shit. I just, I just need some strategies. Thank you. Um, 
So she goes like this. <laughs> and then I said, it's bad, right? She said, it's neither good nor bad. <laughs> it just is what it is. And I said, oh my God, this is going to suck. <laughs> um, and it did, and it didn't. Um, and it took about a year. And you know how there are people that like when they realize that vulnerability and tenderness are important, that they kind of surrender and walk into it? A, that's not me. And B, I don't even hang out with people like that. Uh, for me, it was a year-long street fight. It was a slugfest. Vulnerability pushed, I pushed back. I lost um, the fight, but probably won my life back. And so then I went back into the research and spent the next couple of years really trying to understand what they, the wholehearted, um, what the choices they were making and, and what, what, is, what, what are we doing with vulnerability? Why do we struggle with it so much? Am I alone in struggling with vulnerability? No. So this is what I learned. We numb vulnerability. When we're waiting for the call, it was funny. I sent something out on Twitter and on Facebook that says, how would you define vulnerability? What makes you feel vulnerable? And within an hour and a half, I had 150 responses. Because um, I wanted to know, you know, what, what's out there? Having to ask my husband for help because I'm sick and we're newly married. Um, initiating sex with my husband. Initiating sex with my wife. Being turned down. Asking someone out. Waiting for the doctor to call back. Getting laid off. Laying off people. This is the world we live in. We live in a vulnerable world. Um, and one of the ways we deal with it is we numb vulnerability. And I think there's evidence, and it's not the only reason this evidence exists, but I think that there, it's a, a, a huge cause. We are the most in debt, obese, addicted, and medicated adult cohort in US history. The problem is, and I learned this from the research, that you cannot selectively numb emotion. You can't say, here's the bad stuff. Here's vulnerability, here's grief, here's shame, here's fear, here's disappointment. I don't wanna feel these. I'm gonna have a couple of beers and a banana nut muffin. I don't wanna feel these. And I know that's, no, I know that's knowing laughter. I, I hack into your lives for a living. I know that's, <laughs> God. Um, <laughs> You can't numb those hard feelings without numbing the other affects or emotions. You cannot selectively numb. So when we numb those, we numb joy. We numb gratitude. We numb happiness. And then we are miserable and we are looking for purpose and meaning. And then we feel vulnerable. So then we have a couple of beers and a banana nut muffin. And it becomes this dangerous cycle. Um, one of the things that I think that we need to think about is why and how we numb. And it doesn't just have to be addiction. The other thing we do is we make everything that's uncertain, certain. Religion has gone from a belief in faith and mystery to certainty. I'm right, you're wrong, shut up. That's it. Just certain. The more afraid we are, the more vulnerable we are, the more afraid we are. This is what politics looks like today. There's no discourse anymore. There's no conversation. There's just blame. You know, what blame, you know how blame is described in the research? A way to discharge pain and discomfort. We perfect. If there's anyone who wants their life to look like this, it would be me. But it doesn't work. Because what we do is we take fat from our butts and put it in our cheeks. <laughs> Which just, I hope in 100 years, people will look back and go, wow. You know. um, and perfect, most dangerously, our children. Let me tell you what we think about children. They're hardwired for struggle when they get here. When you hold those perfect little babies in your hand, our job is not to say, look at her, she's perfect. My job is just to keep her perfect, make sure she makes the tennis team by fifth grade and Yale by seventh grade. <laughs> That's not our job. Our job is to look and say, you know what? You're imperfect and you're wired for struggle, 
but you are worthy of love and belonging. That's our job. Show me a generation of kids raised like that and we'll end the problems I think that we see today. We pretend that what we do doesn't have an effect on people. We do that in our personal lives. We do that corporate, whether it's a bailout, an oil spill, a recall. We pretend like what we're doing doesn't have a huge impact on other people. I would say to companies, this is not our first rodeo, people. We just need you to be authentic and real and say, we're sorry, we'll fix it. But there's another way, and I'll leave you with this. This is what I have found, to let ourselves be seen, deeply seen, vulnerably seen. To love with our whole hearts, even though there's no guarantee. And that's really hard. And I can tell you as a parent, that's excruciatingly difficult. To practice gratitude and joy in those moments of kind of terror when we're wondering, can I love you this much? Can I believe in this as passionately? Can I be this fierce about this? Just to be able to stop and instead of catastrophizing what might happen to say, I'm just so grateful because to feel this vulnerable means I'm alive. And the last, which I think is probably the most important, is to believe that we're enough. Because when we work from a place, I believe, that says, I'm enough, then we stop screaming and start listening. We're kinder and gentler to the people around us and we're kinder and gentler to ourselves. That's all I have. Wow, everybody. <laughs> All right, so I am enough. Pretty powerful, huh? What did y'all think about that video? Give me some comments in the chat. Good, yes. I know it was a little bit long, but the reason that I felt like it was so important is because she is such a powerful person and I really feel like her research does an amazing job of, of really helping us to understand the power of vulnerability. So just go ahead and let me know what, what you took away from that. Give me a little, a little chat. Yeah, I know, so powerful, right? Yeah, it's huge. So I am enough. Say that to yourself right now, out loud, every single one of you. I am enough. I have the courage to be imperfect. I have the compassion to be kind to myself and others. And connection is what comes as a result of being authentic, right? So I want you guys to remember that. And again, this is one of those golden nuggets we're talking about today is this is about having the courage to show up with your full self. But remembering this is about healthy boundaries. And I'll tell you, very honestly, I didn't even know what the word boundaries meant <laughs> until a few years ago. I'm not even kidding. So boundaries is a great thing. And again, vulnerability is not about sharing your most deepest, darkest moments with everybody. It's not, but it's about living a wholehearted life. And it's about being able to show up with authenticity, right? And so this is a quote that Brene Brown is very, very famous for. And it's actually a Theodore Roosevelt quote. It's a little bit long, so bear with me and, and just give me the grace because I really want to make sure that this resonates and sticks with you guys. So ready? It's not the critic who counts. It's not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the woman and the man who's actually in the arena. And you guys are here in the arena today, okay? Whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly. So today, let today be the first day in the next chapter of you living wholeheartedly, showing up, being present, being aware, being vulnerable with healthy boundaries and daring greatly, okay? This is the day that you guys 
really do that, okay? So putting it all on the line, healthy boundaries, doing the things that others are scared to do and doing it again and again, even if you fail. This is a growth mindset, okay? Vulnerability helps develop grit and grit is what is required for a growth mindset, okay? This is what it's all about. So if you are ready to have grit and vulnerability, put grit in the chat for me or give me a thumbs up, give me something so I know that you're still here and you're with me. Awesome. The next one we're going to talk about is beliefs. Grit, I love it. Look at all this. Yes, Antoinette says grit. Radhika and Patricia and Becky and Carla and Lauren and Claudia and Tasha and Samia and Tanya, Amari, you're all there. Yes, still doing it again and again till you get it right, grit. Next, we're gonna talk about belief, okay? And belief is the next very, very important tool in this process that we have, okay? So belief. So what are beliefs? A belief is an idea that you hold to be true. And you can base these beliefs upon certainties, probabilities, matters of faith. And a belief can come from different sources, including your own experiences, experiments, acceptance of cultural societal norms, or perhaps what other people say. Our level of happiness and success relies heavily on our belief system. And success and happiness is innately linked to our beliefs. So this growth mindset that we're talking about, your beliefs are a huge component of this, okay? Beliefs shape our reality and they really uh, influence our behavior. So whether our business is successful or not, our beliefs. Whether we have good health, our beliefs. Our character, our beliefs. So there are no right or wrong beliefs but there are beliefs that are empowering or disempowering, okay? Empowering beliefs lead you to joy, happiness, growth, and fulfillment. Disempowering beliefs lead you to fear, anxiety, and doubt. Now, our subconscious mind works instinctually as almost an autopilot mode, okay? And beliefs don't always necessarily work for us. And I was not aware of this um, until I really started starting to examine my beliefs, but I never realized that most of our belief system is put into place before you're seven years old. Did you know this? Uh, I certainly never knew this. So your brain is still developing when you're seven. And so what this means is that you take statements as facts, okay? And I think I took statements as facts most of my life, you know, beyond college, you know, what my parents told me, what my teachers told me, what uh, family, friends, when somebody told me something, I filed that away and that was true, whether that served me and, and really was true or not, okay? And I never thought about questioning those things, okay? But the beliefs, like I said, are instilled by the people closest to you and you develop and you confirm those beliefs as you grow into a teenager and then a young adult. And then we basically chase evidence to support these. So it's not something that anybody has ever done probably in a malicious way and people all do the best they can. I mean, I really believe, uh, and I love uh, Louise Hay, who's one of my favorite um, mentors and authors. And, you know, she talks about that everyone's really doing the best they can at any given time, but families, teachers, and experiences may have passed on beliefs that might not be empowering you right now, okay? And so beliefs turn into self-fulfilling prophecy. If you believe something to true, be, to be true, you're going to look for evidence that supports this idea. With each piece of evidence, the belief gets reinforced. So if you believe, if you grew up believing that you, for example, I'm not smart enough to college, then perhaps you would view each mistake, a bad grade or a tough problem as proof that you're not smart. And this is what we're talking about when we say we look for evidence. Okay. So you have to start to really monitor your headspace very, very carefully. And again, this is where all these tools come into play. You have to be present to even be aware that you're having the thought. You have to be vulnerable with non-judgment to be able to even see if it's something that is still serving you, right? And then 
you can start the process of potentially unlearning any self-limiting beliefs that you may have developed that are preventing you right now from moving forward. And I'm going to tell you, in 85 to 90% of the people that I have coached over my career, mindset and beliefs are the majority of the reason they aren't making the money they want to make. They aren't living the life they don't, that they want to live. They don't have the life work balance they want to have. So this right here, folks, is the golden nuggets for sure. It takes time and practice to train your brain to see things differently, but you can do this. As we learned before, the brain is not static. It's a muscle and you have to train it. There's a voice in the back of your head. You might know it as that inner mean guy or inner mean girl. And maybe he, she says things like, I'm not good enough. It's hard to make money. Relationships are too complicated. There's a lot of things that I'm sure there's that track and it, it's a, like a, a record player that keeps going stuck and it keeps going on and on and on. Okay. Uh, only these types of people are successful people, whatever that those beliefs are. So knowing what they are is going to play a huge role in how you move through life with more ease and how to enable yourself to reach more potential. And awareness, like we said, is the first step to this whole process. And once you know that it's not helping you, you have the ability to change it, okay? So I want you to start thinking about your brain as a computer, all right? Remember floppy disks? I'm probably dating myself a little bit here, but hopefully most of you know what I'm talking about. And so think about the floppy disks getting inserted and stored into your brain your entire life, but they never popped back out, okay? So you have to start to kind of think about what are the programs that are running in the foreground and what's running in the background? Most people are running on autopilot and they don't question the beliefs that are informing the decisions in our emotional state, okay? By making the realization that your belief is not law or fact, but something you've chosen to do, then you're going to be able to change it, okay? So how do you turn limiting beliefs into empowering beliefs in order to reach your full potential? So a tool that I like to use with my clients, when something comes up for you and you feel anything less than joy, happiness, excitement, I want you to use this tool. And this is very, very, very important. What do I believe about this X that's creating me to be feeling Y? And when you use this statement, you're going to be able to start to evaluate, does this belief serve me? And the funny thing is, is when you say it out loud, and I'm going to encourage you, say it out loud, sometimes you end up laughing at it. You're like, what? I really believe that. I wonder where that came from. It actually doesn't even matter where it came from. That's completely irrelevant. Really what's relevant is whether you want to choose to continue thinking it or not and believing it or not. Okay. So write down your belief about success, money, um, and I want you to evaluate, is it empowering or is it disempowering, okay? And um, I wanted us to have some time to pop in the chat, but we're starting to run out of time here. So I just want you guys to do this as an exercise. Uh, and like I said, I don't really think we have time, unfortunately, to do it right now because I want to leave time for questions. But this is important. What are your beliefs around success or money? I believe success is this for me. What are your beliefs around money? And I want you to evaluate, is it empowering to you? or is it disempowering? And then you can ask your higher mind to come in and say, what is the truth here? What is the truth? The truth is, is I can be successful. The truth is I can make lots of money. Money is just energy, right? And then what new beliefs do we want to foster, right? And so you can start using these new beliefs as an affirmation or mantra by repeating it over and over again the post-it notes, the phone reminders. And it might not seem true at first, but this is one of those cases where I can say, you'll fake it till you make it. And I'm totally okay with that because we're trying to shift, right? I am supportive. I am strong. I am powered. Uh, I am courageous. So let's take a moment really quick. I want you guys to choose one of these I am statements and pop it in the chat for me. I am worthy. I am fearless. I am capable. Um, go ahead and pop one of those in the chat for me. I I'd love to see that from you guys. Which one are you going to choose? I am smart. I am worthy. I love this. I'm bold. I'm fierce. I'm successful. Y'all, this is amazing. You are so beautiful. I love this. I'm good enough. 
It's easy to make money. Relationships work for me. I'm full of potential. I love this. This is so good. I'm genuine. I'm courageous, Patricia. I love this. All right. Emotional regulation. This is the last section, and I'm going to go a little quicker through this so we have time to add, answer questions. So emotional regulation is about feeling the feeling but not becoming the emotion. Allowing yourself, like the waves of an ocean, you allow the emotion to come through you and you witness it. You allow it and then you're able to release it. So emotional regulation is a type of emotional intelligence. Practicing this helps you to deal with life stressors. Self-awareness is about tuning in. You need to let yourself feel. It's okay to feel sad. It's okay to feel angry, scared, mad, happy, sad. These are normal things to feel. And the great thing is, is you can step back to process them before responding. And the more you practice, because this is a practice, this is not something that you just have overnight, okay? It's about learning to hit that pause button when the stimulus happens and how you respond. This is one of those situations for me that when I start to find myself feeling triggered, as we all do in different situations, I seal my lips, seal them like duck lips, right? And I just go to the breath and I just focus on what they're saying and I focus on my breathing and then I pause before I respond. And this, my friends, is so powerful because now you don't respond from emotion mind or that lower mind and you give yourself time, okay? So emotion regulation is like, the emotion, think of the emotions as being the flavors of life and regulate them is like being a chef. Great chefs don't avoid certain flavors. We learn to appreciate them, understand them, and work with them. And that's not to say that these things can't be mild or intense. You know, our emotions are like flavors, but you don't want the flavor to overpower the dish. So you moderate it, which creates a much better experience overall. So forward movement, positive change. Again, this is a practice. Be patient with yourself. Have grace with yourself. Talk to yourself the way that you would speak to a friend, okay? With kindness and love. Practice makes for progress, not for perfection. I want you to start each day anew and commit to using these tools, okay? This is a mindset checklist. Uh, I will go ahead and I will pop this link into the chat for you guys. Um, and I think we'll be able to make this available uh, afterwards. I can't grab it right now, but I will pop it in the chat so that you'll have this and you can take this growth or fixed mindset checklist. Um, so now I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna open it up. I've got about five minutes. If anybody has any questions, I would love to go ahead and <laughs> needed to get Marnie today. You rocked it, love you. Oh my God, thank you so much. That's so sweet, I love it. I hope this was super helpful for you. I hope you feel empowered. I hope you'll come back um, on Friday. I'm so excited to hear Mia. She's going to be up next and that's super exciting. Does anybody have any questions? Does anybody want to pop on? Uh, I'd love to, to hear from you. Anybody else? Just I'm getting all kinds of lovely feedback. I'm so glad y'all enjoyed it. It's so great to see so many familiar and wonderful faces here today. That was awesome, Marnie. And oh gosh, thank you, Cherith, so much. You all on Friday, we're really going to be pulling this into how does it apply specifically to your business? So you may be thinking, well, this is all well and great and it applies to anyone. And that is so true. This, what we talked about today helps you set up for small business success, but also personal success. And Marty and I talked about this the other day when we did a, a Facebook live video, but I don't take off my mom hat and leave it at the door. So when I start a small business, if my mindset is in a space where I can't be gritty and I can't think and solve problems, it's going to be much more challenging for me to solve, to, to run my business as an entrepreneur. So this, this foundation is really helping you build your business for success and growth and for struggle and for all of the things that you'll encounter as a small business owner because as Dr. Moore said earlier you're wearing all the hats it's totally different than working for someone else when you have your own business um, and so you, you really can't separate the two and that's why we were so excited about this being that foundation for your business. 
All right, I'm gonna stop talking so I can let you all ask any other questions you wanna ask. Awesome. Okay, so Radhika said, how do you get over being a new entrepreneur when approaching potential referral sources? So I'm going to go ahead and I'm gonna ask our amazing community here, what would you say to Radhika? How do you get over being a new entrepreneur when approaching potential referral sources? So Radhika, let me ask you um, what, it, it feels like you might be feeling like you're not, there might be some feelings I'm, a, I'm not enough right now just because you're new. So what I would say to you is, I want you to really rally around all the wonderful gifts that you have and don't worry about being new. Everybody's new at some point and, and you can still go out and you, you need to be brave and have courage and know that it's going to be okay. And those referral sources, the people who are supposed to be there and supposed to help you will help you and the people who aren't, maybe they'll come around later and that's okay. But I think it's really about working on developing I am enough. I am, I'm great. I have important gifts to share with the world and we all do. And that's really, really important. I hope that resonates. Um, and so uh, Tasha says, meditate and pray and listen to your higher self. Um, and so, uh, yeah. And then if you need some help, you know, with I am not enough and maybe just really kind of that rallying, uh, getting a great coach to help you. I know there's some really great um, resources at the small business center. Um, so I think that that would be a, a really powerful thing. So thanks so much for being here and for your question. Okay. Monique says, how do you know that the business you chose is a good fit when you have multiple gifts? So that's a great question, Monique. Uh, and again, uh, I'll throw that out to the community also to give some response. Um, but what I would say is, Monique, uh, I would really go to some do some research first and foremost, and I would see really what the market um, what, what the market is ready for, right? Like in those different areas, if you say, okay, I'm a really good fit as a photographer, but I might be a really good fit as a real estate agent, or I might be a really good fit as a life coach. I would really look to the market and see where is what we call the, um, the blue ocean. Um, and we'll be talking a little bit about some concepts like that, but the blue ocean, there's a blue ocean and there's a red ocean, right? And so there might be a niche within one of these areas of, um, that, that you might be able to look at where there's an opportunity for you to really dominate in that space. So I would say research, talk to people, see where there's a real need for your business. Um, and then as Alice said, which I think is exactly right on, does it bring you joy? Are you growing? So where there's passion and joy, the money follows. So you have to really follow your heart and where is that biggest gift? And I love that feedback, Alice. Thank you so much. And hopefully, Monique, that that's helpful for you. So I want to be respectful of everybody's time. Sheriff told me I have a hard stop at 1115. It is 1114. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to stop talking now. But I am really, really excited to hear from the fabulous and incredible Mia Lamont. And I know she is going to really get you guys going on branding as an inside job. So thank you all so much, so much. I can't wait to be with you again on Friday. We're going to share with you the actual execution tools and uh we're gonna go over a lot of great stuff on friday so don't miss out share with your friends please come back all the blessings and all my love to all of you thank you so much for being here marnie thank you i actually texted marnie a picture of i brought my own personal planner and i've been taking notes so um, feel free to share you all. Take a picture, tag us on our Facebook page. What have been some of your biggest takeaways? I also am a big fan of the post-it notes and I already made myself three post-it. <laughs> and any of my clients on here will tell you that I've, I've held up more than one post-it note for them in a conversation. So great nuggets. Thank you, Marnie. Um, we're going to take a five-minute bio break, you guys. So 1120, come back. Five-minute bio break. Um, and then we'll kick it off with Mia. See you in five minutes.
Okay. So hopefully you guys got a lot of great golden nuggets from Marnie. Um, we really appreciate what you've done, setting this, um, the tone for today and having that energy going. Um, we're going to try to get Mia on board now. So I want to introduce to you Mia Lamont. She's our brand strategist and transformation coach, helps women entre entrepreneurs and disruptive corporations find their brand. She has the ability to help others achieve their goals by giving them tangible tools and information that can facilitate growth and execution. She can break down complicated subjects into bit to bite-sized pieces. Her unique background in image consulting, leadership development, and transformation coaching, coupled with her futuristic thinking, sets her apart from other brand and business coaches. She is able to use her forward-looking focus to help her clients create compelling brands that inspire. Mia is determined to make a difference in the world by giving her clients a sense of importance while focusing on excellence. She exudes the we can do this attitude and helps her clients build the resiliency needed to become an amazing brand. Her desire for continuous improvement benefits her clients and all those around her. She is the spark that gets things started. Are you ready? for Mia Lamott and branding is an inside job. Let's give her a round of applause. You're muted. Hi guys, can you hear me now? Yay. Uh, Marnie, you brought the energy this morning. I'm gonna just keep up, try to keep up with that just a little bit. And thank you so much for the introduction, Elisa and Chair. Thanks for having me here. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome to you all. Uh, welcome back. And oh my God, all of the stuff that Marnie talked about this morning are actually things that I talk to my clients about. And one of the biggest things that I think that people really struggle with with their brands is that they think they have to be somebody else, right? We think that we have to show up like somebody else. Who else believes that? Who else believes that we have to be more something or we have to be a little bit different or we have to be something other than what we truly are? Yes. Yeah, it happens all the time. So I love the fact that Marnie has already talked about the vulnerability and be, having the courage to be yourself. And many of us don't really know who that is, right? She talked about how sometimes our parents, sometimes our teachers will give us these statements and we start to believe them and we believe that things need to be a certain way. And, you know, I can definitely attest to this when I was in, when I was doing image consulting work and I was also working with an image consultant because I felt like it's super important for me to be able to portray what it is that I do in a way that makes sense to people when they see me. But what ended up happening was that people thought I was judging them based on the fact that I said I was an image consultant. So I really started to think about why that is. And, you know, we judge people typically when we see them, you know, to determine whether they're going to be safe uh, for us. And that is something that we've done since the dawn of time, right? It's something that we do. And it's something that's scientifically been proven that we all do. The problem is, is that some of the stuff that the ways that we judge people are not really how we feel. It's somebody else that gave us that, that notion. So I want to talk to you guys about that. And I want to talk about why branding is an inside job and why we get to work on the inside first or simultaneously with working on the outside or the sexy stuff or the stuff that people think branding is all about. I'm going to share a little story with you. Uh, when I first started uh, my business, it was part-time. I didn't know anything about business. I didn't know anything about branding, but I did have my image consulting license and I was ready to go. I was like, everybody needs to have the work that I can help them with, right? So I hired this guy to do my website for me and he absolutely, you know, he did exactly what I asked him to do, 
but he was also my cousin's website developer. He was someone who developed a website for a, um, for a daycare, right? So now he was helping me with my image consulting. He didn't understand what I did. And he really didn't understand what value I was bringing because guess who else didn't understand it? Me, right? So that was the first iteration of my brand and what I thought it was supposed to be. And then I had someone else who was way more experienced and she does things by instinct. And I was like, oh my God, this sounds really amazing. And I had her help me to develop a brand. Well, in neither of those, those scenarios was I really being me and being authentic and honest about who I was and who I wanted to show up as. And the bio that you guys heard is absolutely who I am. It's who I've always been. And typically we forget this, right? So go back to your childhood, go back to what it is that lights you up. And those are some of the clues about who you truly are and really start to, to get into that, right? So I wanna ask you guys, have you guys ever heard the statement that your brand is what other people say about you when you're not in the room? Have you heard that show of hands? Yes. Marnie, of course you've heard it. Has anybody else heard it? All right, so we're gonna do a little poll. Um, I think we're gonna do a poll. We're gonna do a poll, uh, Sharon, about this one. Uh, so maybe you guys already know who did it, who said it. Yes, Sharon. Yes, I got it, but I don't have the question. I just have the answer. All right, just put the answers up. So I'm gonna ask you guys to take a poll and let us know who actually said this. Everybody finished? Say yes. yes, let me know if you're, you're done with looking, um, with answering that question. Looks like we have about 30, 45% of people have voted. Okay. 50%. Right now we have 39% uh, of people have said Elon Musk, 35% okay. of people have said Jeff Bezos, and 26% of people have said Seth. I'm not Goated. sure. The quote is that your brand is what other people say about you when you are not in the room. That's the quote. Your brand is what other people say about you when you're not in the room. So what, so what was the highest percentage? Uh, Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk are tied right now. Okay. And did everybody answer so far? Looks like we've got about 68% of folks ha have responded. Okay. Well, then you guys are uh, right on target. It, it was Jeff Bezos, right? And he said that. And I actually want to take it a step further. I think that it is what people think about us when we're not in the room. But I also think it's about what we think about ourselves. Mm. And a lot of us don't even think about our self-image when it comes to our brand. We think about, I wanna attract this kind of client or I want to be in this space. And we don't really think about who we are and what our story is and what our experiences are until somebody brings it to our attention that what we think about ourselves and our story is the foundation of our brand. I wouldn't care about the things that I care about if I hadn't had certain experiences. I wouldn't care about certain things if I weren't a certain kind of person. So I want you to start to think about how can you use your story? How can you use your, your brand to convey that story? Who else is doing this right now? Who is using part of their story to convey who they are in the world? Let's hear it in the chat. Like who is using part of their story? I know Marnie is, right? Cause she told us a lot about her story, right? We heard a lot of that during her presentation. So you wanna weave that into what your brand is because it's who you are. Your brand is the total sum of you, right? It's the total sum of you. So who else is using their story in their branding? Absolutely, awesome. Suzette, tell me a little bit more about how you're trying to figure that out, right? 
Marnie mentioned, or it might have been Marnie, or it could have been Brene. She mentioned that we don't have to like tell all our deepest, darkest secrets, right? Unless it makes sense in our brand. So if it doesn't make sense, then it do, you don't need to share it. But I know a lot of people who have shared their mess, right? And it became their message. And that's what I want you guys to kind of look at when you're thinking about that. Yes, we'll talk about a logo in a little bit, right? We'll talk about that um, in a bit because I think that people also believe that branding is all about logos and things like that. And it's only a part of it, right? So I'm glad that Carla talked about that. So a logo is something that we would associate with your brand, but what are some other things? What are some other things that we would put into um, branding in the branding bucket, right? What are some ways that your brand shows up in the world? Your voice, yes. What are some other ways? Yes, your message, your message. Social media, absolutely. Colors, so website, social media website, yes. Anything else is part of your brand? Can you guys think of anything else? Mm-hmm. Well, your brand is way more than though, like it's way more than those things, right? The first thing, your product, absolutely. Especially if you are the product, right? If you are the product, you are the brand. So let's talk about what I say are the seven pillars of personal branding. And you guys should be getting a workbook and you can write these in here and you're gonna have them with the recording. Um, the first one is your mindset. Right. So we talked about mindset earlier this morning. And for me, it's the most important thing because it it influences everything that we do in our lives. Our mindset determines how we're going to get up in the morning. It determines what we're going to put on. It determines everything about us and how we even interact in the world. So I want you to think about what your mindset is uh having you do or having you not do. And that is part of your brand. Uh, somebody mentioned that they were um, a little afraid of going out and putting themselves out there because they're new, right? And I believe that the newness is the part that, that makes you afraid because you're afraid that you might not know what you're doing or you're afraid that people won't want to buy from you because you're not experienced. And I would say that those are the things that you get to talk about, you get to bring those to the forefront so that people can, so you can reframe it in a way that says, you know what, I'm new, but I have a fresh set of eyes and I bring innovation to what I'm doing because I haven't been in the game for so long, right? That's a way to change the way that you see it, right? That's how you change the way that your brand, um, your branding position. So that's just one way that you can shift your mindset in a moment. And uh, anybody else have mindset challenges when it comes to their brand or when it comes to any paradigms that you think you have in the, wor in the world? Thank you, Marnie. Thanks for the workbook. Shout out for the workbook. Yes, so take notes. Anybody have any mindset things that they, they wanna work on? We can totally workshop these right now because I believe that the more we talk about this stuff, the more that we empower each other with our stories, with the things that we're afraid of, then people are more compelled to share. People are more compelled to, to tell us like, these are the things that, yes, oh, okay, love this. Being an introvert slows me down sometimes. I'm an introvert. I love to recharge by being alone. Like what, like I want you to think about how you're saying um, you're being an introvert slows you down, right? So what is it about being an introvert that is slowing you down? And is that something that you've made up, right? If you are an introvert, yes, it takes a certain amount of energy to show up and to do something like this or to show up as a business owner. But it also means that you like to work with your clients on a deeper level. So if we take that, I'm an introvert, and take it to a level of, I like to work with people deeply, that actually helps you right? It actually helps you attract the kind of people that want to work deeply. I love when my, when my coaches, like the coaches that I've worked with, have been able to go deep with me, right? I don't want to do surface level stuff. So when you think about 
all of the characteristics that you have and, and both sides of it, and you use it to empower your brand, that's going to get you way further than, you know, than thinking that it slows you down. I hope that was helpful. All right, let me go. I'm going to take one more. Um, who else believes that no one else is interested or believes in my idea? Who has ever felt like that? I know I have. Like, what am I doing here, right? What am I doing? Who wants to, who wants to know how to do branding and all of this other kind of stuff? Like, I've had those thoughts. But here's the other thing, right? So if we believe something, then it does come true, right, Marnie? It's a self-fulfilling prophecy because people, this is why branding is an inside job. One of the reasons. When people feel your energy around the fact that you don't believe that you're good enough or that your idea is good enough, they can sense that. They can sense it and then they, they will go into the water and they will just kill you with that, right? Or you'll kill yourself before you even get there. And the thing about it is, is that how do you shift that? How do I shift the fact that I think that my idea is not good enough? Well, let's check it. Would you buy it from you? Would you buy your idea from you? All right, ask yourself that. Would you want the services that you're selling? Is your idea, does your idea need to be reworked? Do you need to work with somebody to flesh some things out? Some of us believe that we can go get educated. We're one, we're done. We can get a coach. That's the only coach I'm ever going to have. I'm going to tell you, being in business for yourself and being an entrepreneur is the best personal development course on the planet. And you always will need support. If you believe that you can do something and that's going to be it, then you're, that's a fixed mindset, right? And your business is gonna be fixed and you won't be able to grow. So I really wanna caution you guys into, you know, caution you to know that it's really important for you to continue to grow, like keep going, keep coming to SBA. I mean, keep coming to the Carolina Small Business Center, come into these places that will help you to do the things that you need to do or getting the coach and the support that you need. Because other, if you think you're gonna have one class and it's gonna be great, it's not gonna happen. All right, so that's your mindset. Let's talk about purpose. Purpose is the second pillar of personal branding. And I believe that when we know our purpose and when we know what we are here for, what we were designed to do, it's a whole lot easier to convey our brand message. Who agrees with me, right? When you know what you were born to do, you, are gonna show up in a different way. Like, I know that I was born to do this. I have, um, like I've done the research, I've done the things that I needed to do. I've done the work to figure out what my purpose is. I've done the work to figure out how do I want to put all of the, my experience, all of my story, all of the things that I love into one package and then deliver that to others, right? If you haven't read, um, the Big Leap by Gay Hendricks, I highly recommend it. Somebody was asking Marnie about this earlier. If you don't know what your zone of genius is, then I highly recommend you do that. I also, I, who else here has taken some personality tests like Myers-Briggs or something like that? Somebody mentioned introversion. So I know they, they know that they're an introvert. DISC, okay. Anybody else? Enneagram? Oh, dress your truth. I don't know what that one is, Alice. Tell me more. Dress your truth. Woo, sounds amazing. So there's a there's a, an assessment out there called the uh, Strengths Assessment, and it's by Gallup. So Gallup.com, you can find this. And it asks you a bunch of questions, right? So take the test and really be honest with yourself. And if you feel like you don't know the answers to the questions, or you're like leaning toward one thing and, and not another, this one helped me so much. I took it um, probably like a year and a half ago. And what I realized is that I was making myself wrong for wanting to be the kind of person who likes to think deeply. So I grew up on a farm in uh, West Baton Rouge, Louisiana, uh, far away from here. And uh, my grandparents worked really hard and my, and my mom, and everybody else who was around me, like they physically worked hard. 
And I loved reading. I love to do like, y'all don't know anything about this. I'm going to date myself like, like Marnie was talking about earlier. Like I used to play with fashion plates. It's like the old school Pinterest. And um, those were the things that I was attracted to as a child, right? Before people started telling me what I needed to do and who I needed to be and all of those things. So when I go back and I look at that and I couple it with, thanks Sherry, I love fashion plates too. It was so much fun. Um, I also couple that with what I learned in Myers-Briggs, but especially what I learned in the, in the Gallup assessment. I learned that I'm not the executioner. I'm not the person who's gonna go out and get things done, but I am the person that's gonna be able to spark a fire, right? I am the kind of person that will be able to encourage others to do the same thing. So when you learn these things about yourself, you become way better at communicating your brand and communicating your message. So again, that's why that part is an inside job, right? The other, th the, the third pillar of personal branding is your wealth. So this is going to be your spiritual, your, your physical and your financial health. Health. You cannot, you cannot build a brand if you don't have money, right? We're talking about financial literacy here. We're talking about creating businesses and it is so much harder to build a business if you don't have resources. If you don't have people helping you, if you don't have, um, right? I'm not an executioner. I don't do, I don't execute things, right? So it's harder for me to go in and create the PowerPoint slides or uh, the workbook or the whatever, right? Those things are harder for me to get done. But what I'm really good at is showing up here and talking to you guys. So why wouldn't, why would I spend my time? Like, I'm going to be fully transparent here. Like I didn't give it to my VA early enough for her to do it. So I had to do it. And it took me way longer right? And I got frustrated doing it. But I need to realize, right, I get to keep practicing that it's easier for me to give those things to people who are good at it, who can do it in five minutes, as opposed to my 25 or 45 minutes. So once you start thinking about your brand and your business in that way, right, we sometimes believe that we, and, and sometimes we do, right, if we don't have a whole lot of finances, we do have to do everything when we first start out. But being able to recognize our zone of genius and what we're really good at and starting to farm out the things that we're not good at, it's gonna get us, uh, it's gonna get us to success a whole lot quicker than if we try to do it all ourselves. All right, the physical health, oh my God. So we're not wealthy if we're not healthy. If our bodies are shut down, like we cannot show up for our business, we can't show up for our clients and we can't show up for our customers. And one of the things, and especially if you're working by yourself, right? If you're a solopreneur and you're not taking care of your health, you're gonna be in trouble. And it's really hard to, to keep the momentum going when you don't feel good, right? So you wanna make sure they're taking care of your physical health. And the spiritual part of this, um, Marnie, like everything that Marnie talked about this morning is about that. We get to, start to trust ourselves a whole lot more than we may have in the past. Uh, one of the things that I've realized is that we know everything that we need to know. You have everything that you need to have. You just might need somebody to help you tweak it or call it out for you. But deep down, we know exactly what we need because we have that higher self. And if we tap into that more often, we will make less mistakes right? Tap into what we know to be true for us and honor that. We have been taught, especially women, and I'm not, you know, saying anything about anyone who is not a, a female here, but women and children basically have been taught not to trust themselves, right? I know what's better for you than you know what's better for you. And I really want to caution you guys to, to start to think about how do I start to build that muscle to know that I know what is best for me? So that's what I mean when I'm talking about wealth. I'm talking about the spiritual wealth, the physical and the financial. We want to make sure all of that is intact and that we're working on it, right? Nobody mentioned appearance. This is number four. Nobody talked about appearance. And I absolutely believe that this has a lot to do with our brand, right? So appearance is going to be how we show up, like physically, like what are we wearing? What does our hair look like? Makeup, our grooming habits. 
And also like, what does our collateral materials look like? What does the, not necessarily the website cause we're gonna get into that a little bit later, but what does all of that stuff look like? Our cars, like if you show up in a dirty car, what does that say about you as a business owner, right? It could say that I'm a busy mom and I don't have time to, to take care of a car, right? Or it could mean that, um, that I don't care about my car and I might not care about you as my client. So start thinking about your brand holistically. Start thinking about your brand in a way that it's everything about you. It is the sum of you. And when you start to think about it that way, you, you start to have everything that starts to align, right? Everything will start to align. And when that happens, you feel so much better about yourself. You feel so much better about your brand and people get you. People start to get you. All right, any questions so far? So we've got mindset, which is one, purpose, number two, wealth, number three, and then appearance, number four. Can anybody guess? Yeah, appearance is sometimes the easier part. And it's really easy for people who like fashion plates, right? People who are good at putting clothes together. It is so easy for us. I had a client, um, that's what she reached out to me for. Like we first started working together because she needed me to help her with her appearance. She had no idea how to put things together. And, and I take for granted the things that I know how to do well. So maybe some of you are doing that too, right? We believe that people know everything that we know and it's total, it's total BS. People don't know how to, to do the things that you know how to do. I think that we put ourselves in situations or we follow people that we admire because what we see in them, we already have. And we think that everybody knows what we know because of that, that small circle that we've created. Who else has done that? Who else has um, like forgotten that the stuff that they know might be unique? Who else has forgotten that? Yeah. So that's part of your brand. And you wanna make sure that you're conveying to people what that actually is, right? <clears throat> All right, so the next thing is your behavior. And I wanna be really careful about how I convey this because I'm really thoughtful about, and, and appearance is one of these too, right? I'm really thoughtful about how people perceive me and I'm really careful about what their perception is about too, right? They have biases and they have their own judgments that they're bringing to the table. But when I know that I know that this is me and I know that I'm showing up in a way that's authentic to me, then I don't really care about what other people's judgments are. And my wish for everyone who wants to work on their brand is that they get to that point, right? Um, so behavior, right? I'm talking about etiquette, but I'm also talking about the way that you have yourself. And we talked about that a little bit when we we're talking about self-image. So how do you have yourself? What do you think about yourself? What are you saying about yourself? What are you saying to yourself? Those things are so important and they really do um, dictate how we show up. They really do dictate how we show up. If we believe that we're not worthy, if we believe that we're not smart, if we believe that we don't have a brand or a a product that's, that people will want to buy, we show up in a different kind of way. Can I get an amen on that one? Yeah, yeah, I mean, we do. Like we really do believe that, like we take action based on our beliefs. If we believe nobody's gonna buy from us, we don't pick up the phone to call them. If we don't believe that we're gonna get money from the investor, we're not gonna show up. So start thinking about how you have yourself and how the way you have yourself is affecting how you do your business. All right, the next one, communication. Who here is a grammar Nazi? Let me, let me get a, a hand raised from my, from my grammar Nazis. Mm-hmm, okay. Yes, yes, journalism degree, so yeah, right? Absolutely, Abs I wanna be, I'm a wanna be too, Nancy. So the truth is I mess it up. I mess it up and I take ownership in that. And I believe that people genuinely care about 
my message more so than if I mess up or if I have a typo, right? And as long as the message is on point and I'm being true to who I am, I'm not really worried about typos. Of course, I want to show up in excellence. So don't get, don't like, let's not get it twisted about that. The point is, is that in the past, if I'd sent an email that had a typo in it, I would freak out for the whole day, right? I used to work for judges and uh, I remember sending out an email. It was a mass email that I worked on for probably an hour or so, right? And I had somebody else read it and all of the things. And when, excuse me, when the email went out, it said goof morning instead of good morning. And for me, I was in a tailspin the whole day. But what was I saying about my, what was that saying about me, right? I make mistakes. I'm human. We all are. And when we get to people's humanity, right, that the connection Marty talked about, when we get to the connection and we get to people's humanity, that's what we're selling. We're not selling anything else. We're selling a, ne- a connection, we're selling a service and we're selling ourselves as the brand, right? So don't beat yourself up about this kind of stuff. We do wanna be in excellence, but sending out an email, a mass email, and it, the people who are judging you about making the mistakes says more about them than it does about you. I'm not saying don't be careful, right? I don't. I did not want to send out that email that way, but because I was so caught up in trying to make it perfect, I messed it up. Who else does that, right? Who else is looking for perfectionism? It needs to be perfect. It needs to be, yeah. It's an illusion, y'all. Perfection is not, it does not exist. It does not exist. What's perfect is the way a tree blooms right what's perfect is that the seasons are going to come what's perfect is the way animals um behave in their natural their natural habitat so start thinking about yourself like that right be in your natural habitat what is natural for you i i used to think because i was an image consultant which is another reason why i'm getting away from the the title i believe that i had to be extremely polished and my diction had to be perfect and and all of the things right and what i realized is that that wasn't truly who i am i'm not that's not who i am even though i went to private school right that's not how i grew up and it's not how i want to show up in the world i want to be accessible i want people to feel like they can talk to me and go deep with me and if i have this armor of um i do everything perfectly If I have this armor up that I do that, they're not going to go there. Like people won't share their, their, their fears with me if I'm not willing to share mine or to even be open enough to be myself. Thank you, Samia. Thank you. Yeah. Who else is recovering perfectionists? Who else is waiting? Who else is waiting to do their branding until it gets perfect? Who else is waiting to put up a post on social media until it's perfect to find the perfect picture and the perfect background, all of that, right? I, oh my God, how many times have I said, you know what? I don't know that I can post this because (laughs) I don't know if I can post this because it's not perfect. I don't really know what I'm doing, right? That's why you want to hire people who do know what they're doing. Let them worry about that stuff. You get you get your brand and you get your voice together, they can do that kind of stuff for you. But you got to know what it is first, right? Totally on social media. Like social media is one of my, um, like it was definitely one of my biggest nemesis, so to speak. So the last woman that I hired to help me with my brand, she was really good at social media and she was super judging. So when I would mess up, right? It wouldn't be perfect on her standards, right? So you got also have to realize that too. We all start out not knowing what we're doing in some area, right? So give yourself some grace around that. But the whole social media thing, she, uh, we had, I had somebody else doing some of that for me. And she was like, oh my God, I cannot believe she posted that. That is so not on brand for you. And da, 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 da. And I'm just like, how do you even know that? Like, I don't even know what that is. I don't even know what's on brand for me. So one of the things that I would encourage you guys to do is like be yourself on social media. 
right? If you like to speak in slang and that's how you talk, like talk that way. Your copy should be like you're talking to a friend. I always thought it was the other way around. I thought it needed to be a certain way, but when we speak from the heart and we speak like we're actually talking to people that we wanna connect with, right? Or show pictures like that, right? I don't know if you guys, um, the picture that I posted today about what we're doing today is definitely a brand photo. I had a brand photo shoot and um, like those are important to have, but then they're also, it's important to have things that actually show your personality too. So when you're doing your brand photo shoot, infuse your personality in with the clothes, with the places that you choose to take your pictures. Like stop trying to do stuff like everybody else. Yeah, I got you on social media. Y'all, hello, I'm from the South. I'm gonna say y'all all day long. Or you guys, I say you guys because I've been, I don't know, uh, accused of being from New York, but I'm definitely a y'all person. All right, and the final one, guys, the final place that your brand shows up is the digital presence. We talked about this with the social media, but it's also your website, right? If your website doesn't tell people what you do, why do you have one, right? Uh, your videos, videos like us showing up here, Marnie and I showing up here, this tells you guys all about our brand, right? Her background was staged, my background is staged. You want people to get to know you based on those things, right? Your materials that you're showing up with. The other thing is like videos, podcasts. If you're on a podcast, if you, if you started a podcast, like infuse you and your personality into that. So those are the seven pillars, right? So if we think about our brand as a foundation, right? Those are the pillars of what your brand is, right? So you wanna think about those things and you want them all to be in alignment. So when you're thinking about your appearance, your appearance should look, yes, I will repeat them. Your appearance should be the same as how you appear online, right? Your copy should appear or your copy should be the same as you are in person or how you would talk to a friend or to a business associate. All right, so here they are. The first one is your mindset. The second one is your wealth, which is spiritual, physical, and financial. Your appearance, your behavior, communication. So that's gonna be verbal and nonverbal, right? I talked a little bit about nonverbal, which was a, an email that I sent, but it's also your body language. Body language is super important and if you guys if you haven't read anything about it, I highly recommend uh, researching and stalking Joe Navarro. He is amazing at body language. He's a forensic um, investigator and he's been doing this work for years. So if you want to um, learn more about body language and how to show up that way, I highly recommend him. And then finally, the last one is digital presence. Any questions for me right now? Thank you, Marnie. So sweet. Marnie, y'all, Marnie is so awesome. She reached out to me on Facebook. We've never done anything together. And she reached out to me on Facebook and she was like, oh my God, we're going to be presenting together. I just wanted to say hello. And I was like, oh, I could have done that. So Marnie, thank you for doing that. Like, I think it's really sweet. Like, and it shows her personality, right? I'm, I'm an introvert. I don't really go out and do those kinds of things, but she showed, yeah, it's Joe Navarra. And she showed me like, it's possible. Like, it's not scary for me to go and send a, a message and say hello to someone that um, I'm presenting with. So thank you for doing that. Yes, I'm an ambivert, um, I think is what they call them. Like I'm the flip of you, right? I can be extroverted all day long. People are pretty amazed that, I, that I'm an introvert. But what I really think about, and I want you guys, I don't know if you guys even know this, is that where do you get your energy from, right? If you get your energy from being by yourself, and being in the quiet, you're probably an introvert. If you get your, yes, Crystal, there will be a recording. If you get your energy from being around people and loud music and you like working in a, in a um, what do they call those? A pit where everybody's like in, in one space, then you're probably extroverted. I would die 
if I had to work in an office like that. I would just die. Um, all right, any questions other than the recording? Speak more on wealth. Okay, so <clears throat> when I talk about wealth, I'm talking about the spiritual part, right? So the spiritual wealth that you wanna create for yourself is trusting yourself, right? Trusting your spirit, trusting your soul, trusting your higher power, your higher self. Um, and that takes time to do, unless you have been doing this work for years, right? The physical part, like exercising, eating right, making sure that you're managing your energy. It's not about being a certain size. It's not about, uh, for me, it's about feeling good in my clothes, but also feeling good in my body and having the energy to show up here, to show up for my clients, to show up for uh, my family, to show up for the things that I want to do. That's what I mean by wealth or your physical. And then the financial, um, what is financial wealth to you? I had a conversation with my significant other. We were talking about um, money and I was writing um, a course for, I was writing a supplement for one of my courses. And I was like, I asked him, I was like, does everybody want to be a millionaire or, or better? And he said, no. And I was like, well, how do you know that? You know, how do you know that everybody doesn't want to be a millionaire? And I was like, everybody I talk to, they want to be a millionaire. But guess what? Everybody I talk to wants to be a millionaire because the people I talk to are the people who want to be millionaires. Like those are the people who are seeking me out. But for him, it's like, I don't want to be a millionaire. And I mean, he does really well. He's a physician. So it's not like it's it's not that he can't have it. Right. But then it got me to thinking, like, do people not want to have financial wealth because it's not important to them? Or do people not want to have financial wealth because they don't think they can have it? Right? Some of us don't even have a context of what that would even look like. Making $83,000 a month, right, is a million dollar business plus, right? So can you imagine $83,000 a month? And if you can't, or if you don't even know what you would do with that, right? Does it, Patricia? Does money change who, who people are or does it, ex, um, does it really like show us who they were to begin with, right? So I love that you said this. This is a mindset thing. Absolutely, Crystal too. All right, so here's something that I wanna, that I wanna presence for you guys right now. Sometimes money changes who people are, right? Um, I was told a bunch of lies all my life about money. Both of those are mindsets, right? Saying that money sometimes changes who people are will make you not want to have money, right? Or it'll, it'll have you limit yourself and you might do it unconsciously. Um, sometimes it changes the way people see us, absolutely. But when you're grounded in who you are, it doesn't matter. What other people think of you is none of your business. And I mean that, and I, oh, here's a good one. I don't want to be greedy. So I don't want to want large amount of money, large amounts of money. Guys, what we can do with large amounts of money, we can impact so many more people if we have a lot of money, right? We could give to the causes that we want to give to. We could help people who are in financial dire straits. We could help other women start businesses, right? If we have these kinds of resources, we were given, yeah, we were given, uh, we were sold a bill of goods about money that, that it's just not true. Money is just energy. And once we get that money is just energy, it takes a lot of all of that crap that we were fed before. It takes it and it, and it just kinds of, um, you know, it, it melts that away. And it's, it's constant work, right? Your money mindset, you're going to be working on this for a very long time. Everybody has to work on that. Right. Is it, is the belief empowering or disempowering to say that money changes you or that people will see you differently, right? Money is yes. Yes. What's going to empower you being broke is disempowering. Okay. Yes. Yes, especially as women, right? We were taught that, oh, we should let the man make the money. We should let him be the man and do all of that kind of stuff, right? 
it let him run everything. Money doesn't grow on trees. Absolutely. That's my favorite one. Cause when you think about it, when money is printed, like it does come from a tree, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So somebody asked a question about what do I ask? <laughs> Slightly raising my hand with my head hanging. Yeah, absolutely. So somebody asked about what do I ask my clients when we're working on their brand? I'm so glad you asked that because we're going to do a little exercise and I think you guys are going to have some fun with this. Um, all right. So I mentioned alignment before, and I want to talk about that before we jump into this exercise, right? So when we talk about money and we talk about every little aspect, every one of those pillars in our brand, those things need to be in alignment or they need to be congruent. Otherwise people won't get you, right? So I want you to start to think about what does it mean to be aligned, right? When we are being the kind of person that we've always wanted to be, doing the things we've always wanted to do, and having the life and the brand that we've always wanted to have, then we're in alignment. It's when we're out of alignment, making excuses, saying that, you know, money's evil or people are going to see us differently or I'm not, you know, I'm not going to dress up today because I don't want to make so-and-so feel bad about themselves. Like that's total BS. And we need to start thinking of ourselves in a higher way because the things that you desire, the brand that you desire to have, the person that you desire to be is fully within reach for you, but you got to believe it. You wouldn't want it if it wasn't for you. And I'm, I'm going to say that again. You would not want to have the brand the the lifestyle the things that you want if it wasn't for you and it's just time for you to give yourself permission to to go ahead and go for it right and that's one of the things that entrepreneurship and owning a business actually affords you when i was an employee i couldn't think bigger right because i knew that i had a certain amount of money that i was getting every month unless i got a raise and i worked for the government so that probably wasn't going to happen right so unless I had to live within the confines of what that paycheck was. And when we are limitless, which we are as business owners, like we get to dictate how much money we're gonna make. We get to say how many people we're gonna work with and what, what that looks like. So start thinking expansively about who you are because you already know deep down how you wanna show up in the world. It's time to give yourself the permission to do that. Okay. Are we ready for some fun? Because I'm, I'm, this, is, this is a fun exercise. All right. If you were, we're going to have you guys go into groups. So we have, um, Cherith, I'm going to let you do the math because I don't do math well, other than I know how much a million dollars, I mean, how much it takes each month to make a million dollars. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to break up into groups. And I want you to start to think about your aspirational brand, right? When I say, uh, money is not an object. You think expansively about this. What would it look like, right? So if you had to choose a car, it doesn't have to be, it could be a vehicle, right? Not a plane, not a train, but a car. Um, what would it be? If you had a car to represent your brand, what is that car and why? So I want you to give at least three reasons why you choose that vehicle, Okay. And you guys are going to share with each other and uh, like as much detail as you can, like down to the color, why you chose that color, down to the brand, like what does it need to do? Like all of those things I want you guys to, to think about when you choose this. All right. So I'm going to break up into groups and I want you to share, like share, share honestly. And don't feel like you need to censor yourself because you don't want people to think, oh, she's greedy or she is materialistic, right? There's a reason why people like nice things. Nice things are nice, right? I don't know anybody who wants to drive around in a broken car. I don't. <laughs> it's stressful. I've been there, done that. Like being in a car that's in disrepair, right? Being in a car that is loud or being in a car that doesn't make you feel like your best, like it's kind of dangerous, and, you know, so there's a reason why people love luxury and people love to have nice things. So give yourself permission to, to go for it. All right, Cherith, I think we are ready to break up into groups. 
and um, I definitely want to hear what you guys got to say. So I do want, I do, I would love it if somebody would share after you come back. All right, Mia. So I'm just going to repeat the instruction one more time, make sure we've got it. So you are going to go around in your group. How much time do they have? I would say um, like two to three minutes a person. Like you already know what your dream car is or yeah. some sort, right? So okay. share why you, why you picked it and why it would represent your brand really well. So I'll give an example. So I'll pick a Tesla, right? I care about the environment. So this car is electric. And so that's in alignment with that, right? It's a luxury electric car because I could get a Prius, which I've had before, which there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but this car goes further. And for me, that's more on brand. And um, I, would choose, um, I would choose a white one because I like the freshness of white. So that's what it would sound like, something like that. Great. Yes. All right, perfect. All right, I'm gonna put you all in the breakout rooms. We'll bring you back in about 10, 15 minutes. Here we go.
Is that a fun assignment for you? Did you have fun with that? No one? Um, so I'll speak. <laughs> yeah. So I was telling them, you, you uh, I was a dreader for years. I couldn't dream. So mm -hmm. it, I already knew my cars, like, because I had to go through that journey to get over the hump to be able to dream. So yeah, for me, it's fun to talk about it now because of the fact that I went through that journey and now I can expand from there. Yes, I love that, Kimberly. You, would, you didn't even allow yourself to dream. Right, yeah. I only focused on what I didn't want and that motivated me. Mm -hmm. um, but I had to learn how to focus on beyond that to what I want in order to be able to see it, to achieve it. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. Suzette, I see that you said uh, it required some thought, not a big car person, maybe reflects my state of mind. Um, I'm not a big car person either. I was talking to some friends this past weekend. I got to go to Las Vegas um, to hang out with uh, my cousin who is a car person. And one of her best friends who's like, oh my God, I'm getting the Audi. Da -da 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 -da. And I was like, okay. You know, because that's her dream car. And she's like, that car is like the price of a, a small starter home. And I too would say that I'm not a car person, but it feels like the the car is a lot easier for people to relate to because what I, another exercise and something that you guys could do um, for yourselves if you want to take this deeper is actually build a house, right? Think about if you were custom building a house what would that look like? And it and have it be on brand for you, right? What's going to be the architecture? What's going to be uh, like the features that you have in the house? Like what is a must have, right? So when you think about it from that um, perspective, like I'm, not, I'm totally not a car person. Like I don't care about cars. I just want one that's going to be reliable. I want it to be nice and, I'll, and it has to be an SUV. Like I cannot, I'm not going to be on the ground anymore. Like they love my cousin and she, they were talking, she has um, like a sports car. I know for me, I'll never drive a sports car again, right? They're too low to the ground. I'm the way that, the way that my body is set up, I don't want to be that low to the ground. And I don't like to even drive that fast because I know that if I have the capacity to drive that fast, I will drive that fast and I'll have um, a bunch of tickets, right? I get tickets in my Prius right? Or I did get tickets in my Prius. So yeah, if you can relate to the house, do it with the house, Suzette, and think really, really expansively about it. Like how many bedrooms would you, would you have all en suite bedrooms? And when you think about it from that perspective, like think about your brand in that way. I want people to be able to have their own space when they come to my house. So we're going to talk about the house analogy. I would want people to have their own space and, and a lot of privacy because that's important to me. So when we think about the car or the house, the things that are important to us, we, we want to give to other people, right? So if the, if the car thing doesn't work for you, build a house. Yeah. And then see what the commonalities are, right? There are going to be some things that are common for you. And those are probably some clues about your brand. So somebody had asked earlier, like, what kind of questions do I ask my clients? This is one of them right? What kind of car would you be if your car was a brand? And that's what I ask. Um, all right. Who wants to share about the experience, about what they said, what clues came up for them? Who wants to share? Anybody want to share? Sherry, please share. Hey, okay. Uh I started to type actually that that was a little easier than I expected. So um, what I chose was half hey, funny that you said it a second ago, but the Audi <laughs> and not that I think I'd ever actually um, get one, maybe someday, I don't know. I'm not necessarily striving for this car, but it was about what it re represented, right? I'm a home stager. So when I stage homes, I need them to be luxurious. I'm selling a lifestyle, right? That's what the car is about. I want it to represent, you know, myself is powerful. Mm. Um, 
I'm also a very comfortable person. So, and this is a comfortable car. I am currently wearing a t-shirt and yoga pants. This is how I work as well. You know, not necessarily in presentations, but when I'm on the job site, that's how I'm dressed as I'm comfortable. Um, it's a great quality. We want great quality in our work. It's dependable. Same thing, got to be dependable. And then what color would I choose? It would be white because it's nice, clean, fresh eyes, you know, seeing, giving people a fresh new look on the home that they want to buy and create the, um, to create the dream home for them. How fun is that? Like this was, was this, was this really easy for you to do, Sherry? It sounds like, it sounds like it was and you immediately got it. it. I immediately, like, and when you first said it, I thought, oh my gosh, how am I going to do that? But then bam, like the car came in my head and I was like, why did I pick that car? Why did I pick that one? I don't even necessarily know anything about cars because I really have like, I'm clueless, um, not a car person, but I just started thinking about all of those things. And I thought that's it. Like this is, that's why I picked that one. So yeah, it came pretty easy to me once I, so I thought about it for a quick minute. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Anybody else want to share? Maybe you had some struggles with this. I'll share. I'll Hi, share. Alice. Um, I, I felt very similar that I'm not a car person. And so I thought, what in the heck car would I choose? And my, my business is brand new. I'm just a baby. I have a few clients, you know, so it's like, I, I'm just getting to know myself and clarifying my message over and over. But the same thing, this, this car and this image popped in my head. And it's like, I kind of thought, why would I think that? So I, um, and, and I'm a nutrition counselor and I specialize with weight loss and food addiction. And a lot of that is about deeply like connecting with yourself and understanding why do I keep turning to food and what else can I replace this with? Like finding the deep joy. So I thought of a yellow Volkswagen. And oh my God. I love this. <laughs> Um, because yellow is happy and it's like, let's find true sources of happy, not the temporary drink it, eat it away type of fix. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And you have the top down for fresh air, which is health. Cause I, you know, want to promote healthiness and a Volkswagen car is usually like a girly car. Let's it's like your little fun car to drive, not the family car. So I help women kind of connect with themselves first, you know? So then they can be whatever they need to be to everybody else. But this is about nourishing you and your journey. So anyways, as the previous woman, um, Sherry, was talking, I thought, isn't that interesting that we doubt ourselves so much? But then when someone asks you and when you're in tune, you know, we're really thinking like the wisdom is within. We have to trust ourselves. Like my instinct was the Volkswagen, why a yellow Volkswagen? And then as I think it through, yeah, that makes sense. And so anyways, it's just interesting. She had the same experience that we, we know, we know the answers, especially when we're trying to connect with our higher powers that um, we just need to listen. And go Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. And it's so important, right? The listening to ourselves will help us with like, I know that you're probably doing that with clients right? You're, you're listening to yourself about what they're saying and what they're not saying. And you're actually able to help them in that way, right? Same thing for you, Sherry. Like when you're staging these homes, there's, there's an inner knowing about, oh, you know what? That lamp is not going to work in here. Somebody else on this call might not be able to do that, right? So it's like you guys get to, to honor yourselves and know that you know that you know. Yeah. So thank you for that. All right, guys, we are about to wrap up. And I wanted to let you know that in the workbook, there are some ways that I did put in there for you guys to actually see where you are, like do an assessment for yourselves. I'm gonna quickly go through the, the seven things that you can do like right now to kind of start working on your brand. And you don't, you know, it doesn't require any other help but this, right? So mindset, like start working on your mindset today. So, so important. Um, wherever you feel like you have the most work to do, most of us, it's about trusting ourselves and money. Like I would start there, right? Um, assess where you are on the seven pillars of personal branding. So, um, like give yourself a one to 10 for each one of those categories. And if you feel like, um, you need help with those, like 
look for it. There's help on the internet. There are books out there. And then of course, you know, Marnie or I can help you with some of this. And you can also go to the business center and get some help with a lot of this. Uh, choose one to three areas and focus on those. It is so like, I cannot stress this enough. Entrepreneurs and, and business owners, we try to do everything. But when we can concentrate on the one thing or the three things and focus on that, we're going to have much greater impact than we do if we focus on 10 different things, right? Um, uncover your life's purpose and your zone of genius. Read that book like 10 times and then figure out what your zone of genius is and start farming out the rest. Um, ask for feedback on your brand from trusted sources, at least five of them. Give them the self-assessment uh, questions or use the self-assessment um, tools, but be careful who you ask, right? Not everybody is qualified to give you feedback. Some people are gonna give you feedback that's going to be like really surface level. You want to go deep with this. You want the real answers. So go to people that you know are gonna give you those kinds of answers, right? Not the people that are gonna make you feel good about yourself. Because if we operate from a place of, what people think about me is none of my business, like it's okay how they perceive you and you can just use it as information to change what you need to change or transform what needs to be transformed. Um, communicate your brand message more often. Go ahead and put those posts out on social media. Do a live. We all started somewhere and we all were bad at it, right? And so you get to get better at it by doing it. Like stop being afraid of the action. Do the things that you're most afraid of and, and, and just go for it. Um, trust yourself, operate from your inner knowing and get comfortable with being uncomfortable and know the difference between fear and what you really don't want to be doing, right? Sometimes we'll tell ourselves that, oh, I don't really want to do that when honestly, we're just scared to do it, right? And then finally, own it. Own who you are and what your brand is and keep testing it to make sure that it's you. But, and if it isn't like keep digging, dig deeper and then flex your, your brand muscle daily. Like start showing people who you are and really, really, um, really start owning that. All right. And that's it for me. Um, Cherith, did you want to come up or say anything? You're awesome. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. So powerful. Um, I, I've been taking notes and I wrote down my first car and then I said, is this really my car now? Or is this my high school car? I have to think about that a little bit more before I decide what my car is. Um, maybe we can just share our cars really quickly again on Friday. If you have a little bit more time. How oh, be so much fun. Yes, please do. Yeah. So I hope that you all have this leaves you with those nuggets that we talked about in Marnie's session and that you take the workbook that Mia provided, which I've put in the chat a couple of times and really think through what that um, and, and bring it with you for our Friday session. So on Friday, we are going to be back with Marnie. If you're not registered, I put it in the chat. Um, make sure that you are registered for Friday session as well. We'll be back here at the same time from 930 to 1230. And we're really going to be putting these tangible tools in place to help you go from this idea that we've talked about into action for your business. So this is crucial for implementation. So make sure you're here with us. I promise it's a really good investment of your time. Alisa, I'm going to let you close us out. And thank you all again for being with us. Great job, um, Marnie, Mia, and I was so glad Dr. Moore could kick us off. And I hope to see all of you back here on Friday. Yes, and we do too. We want to thank you guys for taking the time to invest in yourselves. Um, we cannot wait till Friday gets around so that we can put this into action. So we hope that you register and we hope to see you on Friday. And until then, be safe and stay positive and mindful. Bye-bye. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.